to Monkey Talk, the worst podcast on the internet, episode, I think, 8, I hope I'm not mistaken, uh, with uh, Penis Butler, a uh, meme creator and curator uh, that I discovered on Instagram some time ago. He's not really big, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of his, so he gets to be a guest on this show. Please introduce yourself. Uh, well, thank you for that uh, wonderful prefacing. Uh, I I am Penis Butler. Uh, I've I guess I've I've been on Instagram for like uh, just shy of two years now, and I've probably been making original content for the majority of that time. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, it's quite a bit of fun. Um, I guess the reason that I started was um, I going through my feed. I, I remember before I started my account, um, a lot of what I was seeing was just the same stuff over and over. You know, it was I think that was back before Fortnite became a meme, you know, so it was like, you know, B emoji awful, you know, uh, uh, kind of stuff like that, deep fried, but it wasn't shit posts. It was just like, you know, I don't know, the, the same shit stuff over and over. And so on occasion, um, I would see something that I'd like and I'd go, I, I kind of want to model my content after things that I find funny. And, um, and of course, you know, I was always a, a bigger fan of the shit posting and everything. So, so I, I began to model my content after that. Um, yeah, it was it was kind of the same for me actually. Uh, do you have any other pages that I don't know of, or are you only on Instagram? Um, I'm only on Instagram. Oh, actually, I, I take that back. I'm on Twitter um, uh, under the same name, but Instagram for some reason won't let me have the word penis uninterrupted in my, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I have to have a, a period after the P, but on Twitter, you know, it, it's a war zone on Twitter, so they don't care if yeah. you have penis in your name there. Oh yeah, so, they don't give a shit. So it's yeah, basically yeah. the same name, minus one bit of punctuation. Okay. <sighs> anyway. Do you have a, a preference for Instagram, or did you choose to concentrate your efforts on one special platform for a specific reason? I let's see. Is I think yeah, I'd say that I have a preference for Instagram. Um, initially, I started my. Uh, this this is gonna you know I, I'm 26, so I was 18 when I first really started getting involved with internet memes, you know, so that was 2010. Um, and back then, uh, I had two apps on my phone, which were lol pics and mm -hmm. nine gag. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> well, and, nine gag was almost good in 2010. Uh, at the it, beginning, it was, was not so bad. Yeah, you know, that, that's absolutely true. You know, and, and also it's like, the the internet has sort of matured since then in regards to internet comedy. And so back then, you know, that was the entire experience I had. The problem that I had with nine gag or low picks was that you couldn't sift through the content. I think I I've never used iFunny, but I think that iFunny has a way that you can follow specific users. Um, I, never, I never used it uh, either. Yeah, I, the, I, I don't know for certain because I've never uh, used it, but I know that I've heard that. But it, it, um, the I know that on 9gag, all the content that's posted reaches the fresh page, and then from there, as it upvotes, it's sort of like... Uh, yeah, like, you, like, you, like uh, Reddit. Exactly. And okay. so you would have to sift through miles and miles of shit garbage memes in order to find one thing that you liked. So yeah. I started using Facebook for uh, on my quest for internet humor, and that's when I, I actually came across your account. And, I mean, you know, that, that's kind of like going back to the beginning, talking to you, because I found Exploding Fish back in 2016, um, 
and I was like, this is some next level fucking shit, you know? And, <laughs> and it was from there that I was like, all right, this, this is, this is what I, this is what I want now. Um, so yeah, that's, but at, uh, that's neat. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to have inspired you. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah. I, I wonder which was the first because I personally was inspired by a, a page called Asbestos Removal Memes. Oh my God. <laughs> That's the page that made me want to shitpost on, on, on Facebook. I mean, I was already shitposting on Facebook, but on my personal account. And I had a few friends who, who, who liked my posts, but, um, you know... Uh, I discovered Facebook pages. I, at first, I discovered Facebook pages when they make them for brands and businesses in 2011, I think. And, mm -hmm. and I hated the concept because um, uh, I don't know if you have been on Facebook for a long time, but I've been on Facebook for uh, about 12 years now. And I remember that on the beginning, uh, there were no pages. There were just uh, things that you like. For example, if you like, I don't know, Coca Cola, you you could say I like Coca Cola, and it's it's like a topic, you know. But there's no page or anything attached. And then a lot of these pages, a lot of these topics were, um, you know, uh, transformed into pages that were used by brands to send content into our feeds. And uh, I hated it because we didn't sign up for it. The concept was not bad in itself, but the fact that all our likes were transformed into pages, uh, you know, that, that, that really rubbed me the wrong way. So uh, when the shitposting pages trend started, I really felt uh, like it was um, the, the time for revenge, you know. It was like taking back... Uh, that thing that they imposed on us and uh, and you know transforming it into a, a good thing and uh, so I really jumped on the trend and yeah it was that page called asbestos removal memes when I saw that I, I just freaked out I was like wow that, <laughs> it was you know epic but <clears throat> that I, I, I think you're absolutely right um, I I th this is obviously after asbestos removal memes. This is, but um, I remember seeing an account called something. Uh, I can't exactly remember what it's called, but it was normal posting, uh -huh. um, and it was just pictures of stuff. Yeah. And when I saw that, I went, "This, you know, to to the untrained eye, this is just pictures of stuff." But to somebody mm -hmm. that appreciates it or or can understand it, you know, this is some next level meta content. Yeah, context well, is everything. It, well, ex exactly. And so I remember seeing that and, and going, "Wow, anything can be ironic." Um, and you know, I, I don't, I don't know. I think that that was uh, that that was another moment of revelation. But in mm -hmm. regards to you know. Facebook, I didn't feel, I guess back then, I didn't feel like I, I really had the capacity to run my own account or to make my own content. Um, it wasn't until I realized in later 20s, early, early 2016, that um, there was even a meme community on Instagram in the first place. And then that sort of all of the inside jokes and all of the, you know, really meta content and all of that stuff is sort of what inspired me. And then the other thing that I like about Instagram is that I can follow users that I like that, you know, um, it, it, I don't know. I think it's a really good interface for it. It's a photo sharing app that you can follow users on. Yeah, it works. It works really great for for uh, for memes, especially lately. They they they've changed the algorithm, uh, from you know chronological order to random, and that that really killed it for photographers or, or people who make a more serious approach, um, and also for people who are just like sharing their daily life with their family and friends. But for shit posting and and for business in general, uh, it's it's much better. It's it's um, well, it's 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 a it's a trade off, but uh, it works for me. Well, and see, it, yeah, exactly. I don't mind it either. I notice a lot of users still complain about it. One and and especially just recently, uh, your comments now under your post aren't chronological. They're um, 
a lot of times they're just at random, which I think that was a change they did this year. Uh, but, but, you know, for, to me, I don't personally mind it. I guess the, the only thing that I've been noticing that's kind of weird recently, and so it must have something to do with the slide algorithm changes, I'll have posts that are four or five days old that will just hit explore for no reason. They'll, they'll go on the explore page. Um, so, so, you know, I've got 7,000 followers, right? And so a typical post will get anywhere between 500 and a thousand likes. Mm -hmm. And that's probably mostly just my followers that, you know, um, which is still pretty good. You know, if, if it's getting a thousand likes, that's one seventh of my total, you know, amount of followers. Um, I think that I, I heard something that said that uh, Instagram allows between seven and 10% of your followers to initially see your post. Um, and so, so I think that that, that one seventh is pretty good, but um, uh, just uh, I'll um, just today, there was a post that was five days old and I opened up the app and, you know, when you open up the app and you're on your feed is when the little notification bubble pops up and tells you how many people like to post or comment and or follow you. And it was at, you know, 99 likes. And so I looked and it was all the same post from five days ago. And I thought that was, you know, it's been something that's been happening for a few months. Sometimes it bugs me because the post... <clears throat> My content caters to a specific audience, which is people that understand that this is ironic humor, you know. Um, and so when it hits Explore, and I, I notice that there are echelons of Explore or echelons of exposure on the Explore page. So it'll post it or it'll put it in the Explore pages of the most relevant accounts or the most relevant followers. Um and then as it continues to get engagement, they'll kick it up a level and then it'll reach more people. And I've had a post hit some 21,000 likes in a day from Explore. But the problem is, is that um, uh, probably the majority of those people that are commenting under it don't understand the joke. Um, yeah, yeah, I noticed that uh, it started in the summer, I think. Uh, it's and it's the same on Facebook as well. Um, it's you, you. I remember before uh, when you posted a thing, it it got most of its like and and engagement in the first hour or couple hours, and then it slowly died, and there were the laggards coming. Uh, but now uh, you still have a lot of likes and engagement in the first hour, but then you, it it continues to get um, you know likes and comments for several days, which didn't happen before. Uh, I remember when I started in 2015. After 24 hour, a post was basically dead. Right. It it it, it had no more attention. Uh, 24 hours later. Now I, I still get a lot of likes and comments uh, 48 hours later. And that, that's, yeah, it, 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 there was a massive change. Um, I think it was in June, maybe July, but uh, yeah, it was during this summer. And I, I, I still have a, a little, I, I had a hard time adapting to it. I think I'm, I'm uh, but I, I really, I, I don't understand how it works. And anyway, I, I really don't understand how Explore on Instagram works. It, it seems completely random. I, I see when I, when I hit Explore, I, I, I see a lot of very different things. <laughs> yeah. The, I don't really understand why. I mean, I see some memes and shit posts, but I also see I don't know makeup tutorials and stuff like that a lot. I don't, I don't, I don't understand how the algorithm works and uh, if it's really, uh, you know, uh, targeted. It doesn't seem to be that targeted. It's weird. I, yeah, I, um, I do see it. I do see a shit ton of red pictures though, so that's good. <laughs> I, I, uh, so if I go on my personal account which, you know, I follow a lot of just people. 
on my personal. I follow some meme pages, you know, but um, if I go on Explore from my personal account, I'll see a lot of, you know, Instagram photography and a lot of, you know, just random stuff. Exactly what you're talking about. Makeup tutorials, twerking videos, <laughs> shitty, shitty Instagram comedy from Peaks or, you know, who, whatever asshole ex liner decides to make a video but um if if i go from the penis butler account i um will see mainly just memes and recently of course it's been tiktoks um you know in the explore page is just full of tiktoks and um but of course it's not exactly relevant um to the type of content that I like or post. Uh, But it's close enough that every once in a while I'll go there and scroll. Um, But, but exactly is it's, I think that they find loose connections to the type of content you post and the type of engagement you have. And, and then they just fill your explore with that stuff. And then whatever else, you know, I think, um, Here's an interesting thing is, is that there's an account, um, I forget what it's called, Champagne something or other, um, that, that uh, I've talked to in the past. And um, the gal that runs that account was saying something, she, she posted something about how in the terms of service on Instagram, it will... It, it, it says in there that Instagram automatically um, sort of suppresses the exposure of a post that has text on it, of a picture that has text on it. Um, oh. And, okay. And, and so, you know, um, I would just, I, I don't know if it'd be the same on Facebook. I know that, you know, they are owned by Facebook. But they're both owned by Facebook. But, you know, that was something that really uh, was kind of a little troubling, in my opinion. Uh, But at the same time, you know, I see accounts that are monstrous. Um, You know, there's uh, your Lord and Savior meme Jesus or whatever. He's got like 1.7 million followers the last time I checked. Um and that's a lot for somebody that posts ironic content. You know, um, it's not Daquan, that's for sure. But it's uh, so, so apparently it, it's trendy now. So I, I see a lot of celebrities following uh, accounts like this, which is which is kind of cool. I, I yeah. there's 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 something that um, a friend of mine said who's. His content is really, really meta. Uh, his name is Onion Pepsi. He's got a, a very memorable account. But he was saying, he, he said a, a, about a year ago, he said, I will make a meme or I will see a meme that six months later becomes mainstream. Mm-hmm. And so seeing people like Elon Musk, for example, you know, he's sort of jumped on the meme bandwagon. Yeah, it's kind of cool, but it also yeah. harkens back to the fact that it all is birthed from somewhere, and it's birthed from the fucking bowels of internet humor, like my account, you know, or yeah, yeah, ac- yeah. or accounts that uh, that that's something is it's like the internet starts with an underbelly of weird content, mm-hmm. and then that content I think becomes more accepted slowly over time by a wider audience until eventually. Yeah. Yeah. It's just uh, a matter of time. Yeah. Yeah. And so like, yeah, maybe, you know, uh, that people can't explain a vine to their grandparents or something, but everybody under the age of 40 knows what a vine is. And, um, you, you know, so I think that in the future we'll kind of begin to see more and more, meta content more and more uh you know just just plain weird stuff shit posts things like that become more popular yeah yeah well 
it, it's already popular outside of the internet, I would say, like uh, with things like the Eric Andre show, for example. Oh, yeah. Uh, who has had quite a lot of success. There was Tim and Eric before him. And um, yeah, I'm um, I'm thinking of another one, but I, the, 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 I can't remember the name. But you see what I mean. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's getting... Uh, it's not... Memes, you say that they jumped on the meme bandwagon, but I, I got a feeling that meme is not a bandwagon anymore. It's becoming, <laughs> it's becoming a, a, a staple of uh, popular culture. Just like, I don't know, just like comics used to be in the 60s. Or, uh, you, you know, um, just like uh, stuff like that, you know. And, I, um, yeah, yeah, I, I, compl- I, I agree with that. Because um, I... I, I I guess, like like you say, I've been seeing it more and more. But then, yeah, it's kind of funny that the outside world, I, I don't... Adult Swim with shows like the Eric Andre show, they influence memes a lot. Yeah. Whether that's intentional or not, I don't know. But I know that it's it's really interesting and unconventional humor which I think will follow the same trend because the Eric Andre show and Eric Andre himself, they have a, quite the cult following. And uh, the, also um, I think a, probably a much wider audience than, you know, than shit posting does. But um, it, it's so funny to see how they affect meme culture a lot just based on the fact that their content is relatable by the creators of memes, um, or that at least it's referenceable, if nothing else. And um, there, there's an Eric Andre joke, what if it were purple? Um, and I've seen so many edits of the same, you know, four-panel meme where, you know, it's a, they'll just take a picture of that, that Sheba dog that um, you see – I'm trying to think of what Doge? the name. Yeah, the Doge. Um, where, y- you know, you'll see somebody just adjust the hue on that and turn it purple. And then, you know, that then that makes a meme. And because a lot of people watch the Eric Andre show, you know, they appreciate it just for that alone. Um, it, yeah, so so I, I, uh, I agree with that. I think that... Um, and as the years go by, who knows what it'll look like five years from now? You know, I yeah, 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 and and yeah, yeah, of course. And it's um, it's a, it's a two way uh thing. I don't know if you remember, but a few uh, weeks ago, um, Eric Andre posed uh, with uh, death grips, and he had yeah. a, and he had a <laughs> shirt that said "Peace Start in the Bolt." Mm-hmm. Uh, the picture with them on the stairs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and it's uh, it's a meme made by I think it was made by Gangster Pepe. Yeah, um, and uh, so so yeah, it's it's getting uh, it's getting mainstream basically. Uh, I see a lot of um, celebrities following uh, mainstream shit. Uh, I saw uh, I think Fuck Jerry is is followed by uh, you know actors from TV shows and shit. Oh um, sure. Pyrocynical is followed by Kanye West. Uh, yeah, isn't and that even, crazy? And even yeah, and even at a, at a lower level, uh, shit post about uh, five thousand is followed by Michael from Vsauce. What? Um, yeah, I'm I'm followed by uh, Harley Morenstein from Epic Meal Time. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's. Well, those are internet people who are already have a foot in the in the internet culture, so it's less surprising. But uh, it's still, it are, it's it's big creators with tens of millions of, of followers, and uh, so we we are a, a small degree of separation from from fame. Uh, it's um, and I think that's how uh, we infiltrate the mainstream. It's just. <laughs> It's just trick, trickle down cultural uh, influence, you know. Oh yeah, you know. Uh, it, now, now that I think about it, it's funny that you uh, mentioned Michael from Vsauce because um, I'm he initially started out on YouTube um, with a 
comedy account. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Before he started Vsauce, yeah, and yeah I, I can't, remember. I can't exactly remember what the comedy account was called, but uh, um, it was called Pooplicker Five Five Five, I think. Yeah, yeah. It, I know it had something to do with poop. Yeah, and um, and then you know, be, I guess I I didn't watch Vsauce or or you know Michael back then, but. You know, it was kind of interesting the first time I saw him do a cameo in like an iDubs video or a Max Mofo video. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, so it, it was kind of funny to find that out. But you know what's something that I've been noticing, too, that I feel is kind of a downside to all this is um, brands. You know how you mentioned brands earlier sort of sort of taking over Facebook and advertising all over our feeds and you know, um, just the other day, well, I, I guess I've been seeing it for a while. There is a Geico ad. Uh, do you get Geico ads in France? Uh, no, I, I'm not sure what Geico is. It's, a uh, it's an insurance company. They insure your cars and homes and things like that. Okay. But they're, they're famous for having this mascot. That's an, that's a gecko who talks with an Australian accent. Weird. Um, but okay. And Anyway, so this is 2018, right? And, you know, does anyone, uh, uh, do you play Temple Run anymore? Have you played Temple Run at all in 2018? No, no. Have you, do you know anyone that's played Temple Run in 2018? Uh, no. <laughs> Me I, neither. I remember playing it, I remember playing it back in the day, a few years ago. It was fun, but not recently, no. Exactly. And so this Geico ad, uh, they took the mascot, you know, the little gecko, and to try to make him. And it's funny because I see these brands trying to jump on internet trends to relate to a younger audience, and um, so they put the mascot of the ad in like this Temple Run themed advertisement, and he says something to the effect of like. If I would have known I was running in Temple Run, I would have suggested that you'd save a bunch of money on your car insurance. You know, something super fucking lame. And um, and and I just, I couldn't believe it. I was taken, I was completely taken aback that, you know, they were that far behind the trend. And another one is uh, Subway. Subway did an ad where they incorporated a bunch of bottle flip challenges like <laughs> a, a bunch of people in the ad were doing bottle flips okay that's that's less old but yeah it's still uh it's still it, a bit and, dated. But, but this is a very recent ad it it i think the earliest i remember seeing it was like in july and i you know so you're gonna i i understand that like you know they they have to play it safe with like their with whatever their advertisements are and so on. But they're so behind the curve that when when they jump on these trends, they're far gone. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah and, I remember. It just, I remember the last time I saw a bottle flip uh, was when uh, Emmanuel Macron, who is now the president, made one during, yeah. during his campaign. And when politicians do the thing, it was you know. I, a year and a half ago, and when when politicians do a a, a a trendy thing, it's all it's normally the last of the last step, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's beyond PewDiePie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> but but yeah, I know that. Um, you get? Did did you see Trump? He shared this thing. Uh, it was a. It's essentially a meme. It's a. Did, um, did you see it where he's? It's sanctions are coming. You know, it's referencing the sanctions that the U.S. is going to put on Iran, and it's an edit of Trump based around and it's a Game of Thrones text. You know, just like I can't oh, fucking okay. believe yeah, like, it. Like winter is coming. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Uh, yeah, I, it's did not, not, I, I did not see this one, but I remember the last time we shared a meme. Uh, and uh, I remember also uh, when uh, in his uh, inauguration speech, he quoted uh, Bane from the Batman movie, The Dark Knight. Yep. That was fun, too. 
Um, yeah, but it, I don't think, you know, he didn't come out and say he quoted Bain, but it was like word for word. Um, but this is the president. Like, I could not, you know, okay, so with Emmanuel Mac, how do you pronounce it right? How do you pronounce his name right? Emmanuel Macron is what we call him. Yeah, yeah, Macron. So, uh, I'm probably going to butcher this, but Macron, Ma- I can't do the, the guttural throat thing. That's fine. Um, but anyway, um, you know, him doing the bottle flip challenge, that's pretty harmless. You know, it, it's just, it might be behind the curve, but, you know, it's still silly. And I, I remember seeing something about it, and, and people online were obviously intrigued by it. But this, the Trump thing, under, in the comments under that were just loads and loads of comments in Arabic text, you know, Iranian people commenting on it, um, you know, saying that this is going to horribly affect their lives. How do you make a joke out of it? You know, this, that, and the other. And while I am a proponent of thinking that nothing is off limits to joke about, um, just because I feel like humor is a good coping mechanism for the difficult things in life. Yeah, I agree. This is... This is the president, though, and I think that he should no, – this is kind of a – I don't know. This is a political opinion, which I'm not even huge about having. Um, <laughs> but he, I think you know, maybe he, sh- he should be held to a little bit of a higher standard of, of decency, um, especially in regards to serious political decisions um, and regarding a violent country – well, not, maybe not violent, but um, a powerhouse – you know, anti-Western country like Iran. Um, so I thought that that was that that was another thing that was just like oh, Jesus Christ. You know, I so there. I think to tie it all back together, I think that there is a little bit of a downside to meme culture becoming mainstream, um, and brands and politicians are the downside. But it. Uh, you know, I mean, yeah, I, I, I disagree. I, I think uh, it's always funny. Uh, sometimes you laugh with them. Often you laugh at them. But <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, I don't really see the I don't really see the problem. Uh, let them have the, their fun and think that they're uh, trendy and uh, that they're still with it. You know, um, I mean, I, I uh, yeah, I, I enjoy it all the time. Uh, I remember when Trump posted um, a picture of Pepe uh, after the election. <laughs> that was super funny too. I, mean, I think that that uh, I don't know if I'm correct in saying this, but I think that M- Milo Yiannopoulos, you, you know Milo Yiannopoulos. Oh uh, yeah, he of was, course. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I know him. Um, I think that he, you know, he and Trump were in contact oh, it yeah. almost makes me wonder because i mean trump is in his 70s you know the guy is i mean he might be on twitter a lot but i'm not sure how much time he spends looking at memes so it almost makes me wonder if like milo yiannopoulos who was mm-hmm. obviously a huge fan of 4chan reddit and the pepe meme yeah it makes me wonder if he didn't have something to do with trump posting that as sort of like a dog whistle to the people that, you know, supported him. Maybe. Um, but yeah, I think that, uh, I guess the only, the only politicians aside brands and and their advertising, um, you know, that's kind of like, I guess to me, and, and not to stay on the subject for too long, but I guess to me, it's, um, when, not only that they're behind the curve, but the, the you know they tend to over advertise. You know, on YouTube now, pretty much any ten minute video has like three or four mid roll ads in it, and oh yeah, and a lot of them are trying to be relatable and so on. I don't know. It's just a little bit of a thing that bugs me, and I'll get over it. But um, you know that that's just kind of something that I notice is that when they try to be relatable with, with internet based references they're behind. Um, it would be interesting. 
I think, if they were to just hire some random guy off of Reddit or Instagram, you know, somebody that was really with the times and consulted with him, because... I think, yeah, I think some do, like... Uh, you've probably seen uh, Wendy's. Oh, yeah, Wendy's. That's ha that's actually um, something they're they're they have a pretty good thing going. Um, I like their the Twitter account and everything. You know that they've sort of become a hero just for their presence on the internet, and you know their their clapbacks and burns and things like that. Um, So yeah, you're you're probably right about that. The, the the funniest shit about it, in my opinion, is that now you you can see a lot of commies that starting to uh, you know uh, be uh, angry about it, like <laughs> oh uh, corporations are trying to uh, seem hip uh, and and like people, but uh, they are oppressing workers. Uh, it's a hypocrisy. Uh, don't fall for it. <laughs> Uh, when I saw that, I was just taken aback. I was just, this is like the last thing that I was expecting to happen. And it's so funny to me. Well, uh, yeah, because cause they, um, I, I don't know, It's it, you see them everywhere. I even get them on my posts sometimes, you know. Uh, but especially on Twitter, Uh, you know, and, and I have a lot of friends that refuse to use Twitter exclusively for that reason, you know, it's because you'll get some nut job in, in your mentions every once in a while. <clears throat> um, yeah. But yeah, you know, because how many followers does the Wendy's account have, you know, especially since they've become Internet famous as a meme of themselves? I don't know. Pro you know, uh. probably in the millions. And so you're going to get some crazy person in there every once in a while that's gonna you know uh be crying about something that doesn't affect them um mm -hmm. which i mean it's th this is something about the internet that i think is kind of interesting is the fact that now anybody can share their opinions and you might get you know, comments in response to it, but you're not, you're not talking to that person face to face, you know, you're not even calling with them, you're just typing a message back and forth, you know, so if you comment yeah. something, um, okay, so, um, you know how people used to make fun of Tumblr for, you know, having radical opinions and, and um, mm -hmm. being an echo chamber for those radical opinions. I think it still probably is, but there's also a lot of rational people on there, too, that have regular opinions that, you know, you and I could yeah, agree with. Of course, the, the majority has. Um, Tumblr is, an, is it can be an echo chamber in the same way that uh, Twitter and Reddit can be, if because you follow who you want and you, you are not exposed uh, rarely to things that are outside of a specific community. So it can become an echo chamber. Uh, I gotta say that I've been on Tumblr every day for almost 10 years now, and I've never stumbled upon an SJW. Uh, right. You, you can find them if you look for them, you know? You have to be actively looking for them to, to find them. If you just go on Tumblr and use it normally, it's likely that you won't see them at all. Do you like Tumblr? Or do you think that it's a... Because, cause, I mean, I've, I can't say that I've ever been on the website for more than a short period of time. Um, I've never had an account. And so do you think that it's, it would be worth it for, you know, just some random meme guy to make an account? Uh, it's hard to get big on Tumblr with a meme account. Uh, they, they usually don't uh, grow that much. But uh, I gotta say that from all the places on the web, uh, Tumblr is probably the best for shitposting. It has an amazing shitposting community. And I'm, I mean, it's Tumblr who, who introduced me to shitposting. That's how I, I that's how I uh, discovered the thing, and that's how I uh, became, you know, in, in enamored with it. Um, and and yeah, there are a lot of great memes are, are created on Tumblr. Uh, we've, we were talking about the Doge meme a, a few minutes ago. It's, it comes from there, for example. And um, it's yeah, along with 4chan, 
uh, it's my favorite place on the internet because of the the community and because of how uh, fast it goes and because of how creative it, it it can be and how reactive it is. Yeah, I one thing that I tend to like is the is Tumblr text posts. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's how it started. Uh, a lot of people call that called that uh, night blogging at, at first, uh, because people were put, were making uh, weird text posts when they had insomnia and they were you know r rolling into their bed, couldn't sleep, and had these weird thoughts. And they started you know um, posting that on on Tumblr, and it became weirder and weirder and more more shit posty. Uh, and at first it was called night blogging, and and then it evolved into shit posting. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, those text posts uh, started the whole shit posting uh, trend back then in I'd say twenty twenty ten. Yeah, because I see, yeah, I see some Tumblr text posts that are from way back in the day, and you know, I can't think of. I'm I'm sure that you're probably absolutely right about that because you get a lot of people with an interesting sense of humor that really. Um, you can display well on the internet. And uh, so <clears throat> I used to, when I was a, a little bit younger, I, I used to be pretty good at, at, at least I feel like I used to be pretty good at making jokes, talking to people. But as the years go by, I spend more and more time just working and then hanging out alone. Um, so I sort of lost that ability. But um, I think that another thing is like I've sort of found an ability to channel my inner humorous person um, on the Internet. And so, you know, like some of the th things that I see people coming up with, they might not fly as a joke in a real life conversation. But on places like Tumblr, people would read it in a uh, I, you know, I can't tell you how many hundreds of times I've seen a text post and um, and I've thought this is the most absurd shit I've ever read. I fucking love it. And, yeah. um, you know, and I mean, it, it, I was sort of it, it enamored the same way with, you know, shit posting with actual images. Um, you know, it, it was just kind of something that I thought was obscure and I thought was uh funny in its own weird way and and so yeah some people <clears throat> you know uh, speaking of facebook back the only facebook account i've ever had and i still have it is my personal facebook account but i had a couple friends well, well i should say that um on my personal account i was mainly friends with people i knew um and as the as as time went by, there were a couple of people that I was friends with that had a really obscure sense of humor, and I think that that was probably my first introduction into shit posting because I'm the kind of guy that like I'll find something that I like, uh, and then I'll keep sort of searching for that next level thing, you know? Um, yeah. And yeah, yeah. So I don't know. Um, there were these Facebook accounts. There were a couple of them that were really, they were pretty small accounts, but um, it was sort of like, you know, that purposeful misspelling of words. And mm -hmm. you, um, yeah. for example, like, do you remember the account? Hello, it is I, Jimbo's non trombo. Vague, vaguely, yeah, but uh, yeah, it rings a bell. Yeah, so it was sort of like that. You know, it was the people started making accounts like that mm -hmm. about celebrities and so on. And <laughs> um, you, there was one through this basketball player. Um, I, I don't even remember the guy's name. But, you know, um, some of the shit that, that he was putting on his statuses was, was absolutely outrageous. I And um, I was absolutely enamored with it. So, you know, thanks to those couple of friends of mine, I got, you know, my first little taste of it, I think. And then uh, they started sharing uh, ridiculous text posts, too, mm -hmm. which is what sort of made me realize. You know, well, first, I had no idea what website these were coming from. Mm 
Yeah. You know, this was back in like 2011. Mm -hmm. Um, Because, you know, the format was nothing I had ever seen before. And then eventually I figured out they were coming from Tumblr. Mm -hmm. Um, And it seems like every, um, there's another website that I used to go on outside of nine gag back in the day. Um, it's called pleated jeans. Oh, yeah. Um, you've been on it. Oh yeah. 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 Love this. So the guy, the guy that runs that account, Jeff white, or that it's not an account. It's a website. Mm-hmm. Um, Jeff Y. Sasky, I think is how you pronounce his last name. No idea. Um, he scours the internet all day looking for ridiculous shit. Mm-hmm. And I used to go on there all the time and he would make a list of, you know, it, it was a few times a week. He would update his list of 20 text posts that he found that were funny. Yeah. And so I would go there and look through them and, you know, I, it, anyway, so, so that was sort of like the second level introduction that led me to what I am now. A monster. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, pleated, um, pleated jeans. I think that uh, they uh, they continued for a long time, uh, and also there's uh, another uh, site that's quite similar called Tastefully Offensive. I don't know if you know it. Yeah, yeah. I've I've actually been on Tastefully Offensive before. It's kind of the same thing as pleated jeans, and uh, yeah, yeah. It's it's a kind of curation that uh, caters to uh, the meme enthusiast. But also well, to, that's what to, you do too. But also to the general people who like absurd humor or weird shit, and um, yeah, 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 yeah. It's um... let let me ask you this: when when did you start exploding fish? Uh, May of twenty fifteen. And uh, how long did it take you to grow a sizable following? A few weeks. So did you? Did you notice that just a bunch of followers rolled in when they found your account or did you have people that uh, shouted you out or anything like that? Um, there was there was a bit of both. Uh, people started rolling in really fast. I remember I went to zero from thousand in less than a week. Um, oh, wow. But... Um, yeah, I uh, people started rolling in quite quite quick, but also I had a few shout outs for from bigger pages. Uh, and we did the um, the S four S as we said in the um, in, back in the days, the share for share, and mm-hmm. um, you know uh, you know the fresh new page, so you share something from a bigger older page to uh, help them garner a, a new audience, and you gain from it because you are exposed to their larger audience. And sure. um, yeah, thanks to uh, I think uh, a, a big uh, a big help was when uh, Orange Memes uh, shared me. Is Orange Memes still going on? Are no. they still running there? No, it has been closed for a long time now. That's a shame. Yeah, because um, I, I remember that account. Yeah, it was really good. I wish I could get the admins on this podcast. It would be really cool. Uh, but yeah, I, re- I remember I was uh, especially friends with one of the guys who, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the name. Uh, but um, yeah, yeah, they helped me uh, when I was, uh, uh, f- w- they helped me getting from five to six figures um, quite quick. That's but, awesome. Yeah, uh, thanks to them, I, I went from um, 70,000 to 100,000 in in no time. And, um, yeah. Yeah, I guess the reason I ask that is because um, I notice sometimes on on Instagram, um, for example, a good friend of mine, uh, he runs an account that started out as a spam account. Um, and <laughs> then it, it started just gaining this following super fast. Um, and he's at like 11,000 followers now. I don't think he's had the account for a year. Maybe he has, um, without a shout out. And his, so his account is Jack Spam and such. Um, and it, it, uh, I think one of the things that people really liked was he posted several times a day. Um, I also like his taste in content. And so clearly 11,000 other people do too. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I I started my account. Uh, I'm trying to. Th- 
I started my account in April, April 14th of 2017. Okay. It was 2 a.m. in my ex-girlfriend's apartment. <laughs> She was snoring super loud, and so I couldn't fucking sleep. And uh, so I was like, you know what I should do with my time right now is start a meme account. And I started out doing the same thing. You know, I'd started out just sharing content that I liked. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember, like, the first two days I had 30 followers. Um, And, (laughs) like... People are still surprised to know this, but I, you know, I have five out of my six siblings follow the account, my account. My dad follows my account. I think my stepmom follows my account. Um, That's cool. I mean, yeah, but uh, that that I'm gonna. uh, That reminds me of something, but. So 30 followers in two days, and I thought, oh, you know, if this growth rate continues like this, you know, then I should have a 1,000 followers by the end of a year. Mm -hmm. And when that first year, well, just shy of a year rolled around, I had 400 followers. Growth was really slow. Mm -hmm. I didn't get a single shout out from anybody. Um, I didn't know any larger accounts. You know, I knew smaller accounts. Um, but really, you know, I was friends with people that had a thousand followers or, you know, 1500 followers, but nothing, nothing like a hundred thousand at the time anyway. So, um, eventually one day I made this meme. Do you remember content zone? Oh yeah, of course. I made a meme that I thought content zone would like. Uh Uh-huh. And I was, you know, I've never really been the type to just reach out to somebody and, and, you know, send them something. But, um, I, I made a meme, uh, and I sent it to content zone and the admin immediately responded and was like, what the fuck is that? (laughs) I was like, I was like, what do you think? And he was like, I love it. I'm going to post it to the Facebook account. Nice. And I think the Facebook account had like 170,000 followers at the time, mm-hmm. um, which was larger than the Instagram account at around 80,000. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, you know, it it got several hundred likes on the Facebook account. And then he posted it to the Instagram. And it was then that I gained 600 followers in a day. Nice. And I was like, this is badass, you know, and... Um, so it wasn't necessarily, you know, that that's a that's a, a, a share for share, I I guess, in sort of a disconnected way. I shared his content. He had no idea that I did that. But he shared my content and boosted my follower, you know, ratio by 60 percent or whatever yeah. or 150 percent, I mean. And um, so it was after that, after I had a thousand followers that. I started noticing my account growing um, at a more exponential rate. And I think it's because to just the random person scrolling around, if they find an account that just has a couple hundred followers, that's pretty, that's small, you know? And so I think that people subconsciously in their mind will, will, will think, Well, you know, yeah, they might post good content or whatever, but they've only got a couple hundred followers, so... Uh, Absolutely. Actually, that's been proven. I saw a scientific study. I saw a very serious scientific study recently, uh, which showed... Yeah, which showed that... uh, They showed uh, people uh, Instagram posts, like, identical, but some had, like, 10 likes and some had, like, 1,000. And people, uh, uh, people's brains had more activity uh, when the picture has a thousand likes, uh, uh, even if it was exactly the same picture, it's, um, it's, uh, it, it, it made more positive activity in the brain um, based solely on the number of likes it had. So, um, yeah, when, when you see a picture that has more likes, you, your brain automatically thinks it's better. There is a, a, a chemical thing that happens beyond our consciousness. Sure. Um, and it also makes me wonder if it doesn't um, sort of harken back to like the safety and in, in numbers type of thing. 
um, you know how a trend it starts with a couple people and then at, you know so <clears throat> I guess hypothetically let's say for example like we're uh, we're, we're at a concert uh-huh. but nobody's dancing right and then so one guy gets up to dance and then another guy goes and joins him now that's two people dancing and then so a few other people will look at that and go hey that looks like fun i'm gonna go do that yeah and then more people are going to see this small group of people dancing and they're going to go oh that looks like fun i'm going to go do that it initially had to start with those few people and then as it grew, more and more people began to realize its validity as a trend. Mm-hmm. And and then from there, they went, oh, shit, you know, that looks awesome. Let's go do that. And so that makes absolute sense. Um, and it's kind of been a theory of mine for a long time anyway, you know, that like if uh, you, you get a lot more account growth if you have 2,000 followers than if you have 200. Um, and, and I think that a, a, if not the primary reason – a contributing factor is your amount of followers. Um, Cause it, you know, you could post the, the best fucking content on, on the planet. Um, and if you have 30 followers, people aren't going to take it seriously, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and so unless, I, unless you get shouted out f- by a larger account, then you get credibility automatically. And, uh, you know, another thing that that reminds me of is um, uh, I remember Philip DeFranco went on the H3H3 podcast mm-hmm. um, and Ethan asked Philip, he said, so, you know, how do you think a YouTuber starting out now would, um, you know, how would they grow and you know, Philip said, well, I have, I have no idea how they grow because, um, you know, you might have better equipment now, but there's, there's an exponential, exponentially larger amount of activity on YouTube. And so you're going to get lost in the fray, you know, you're, yeah. you know, it'll take you forever to develop a following, um, unless you have a connection to a larger account that essentially, you know, or a larger YouTuber that shouts you out or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so I think the same thing, it's the same thing with Instagram. Um, You know, I have some friends that talked about that they joined in 2014 or 2015 when uh, joined Instagram back in 2014 or 2015, um, when they said that the meme community was really sort of taking off. Um, and, and, um, so back then, you know, like there, there was a handful of accounts, right. And now there's a cup, you know, a few million probably Mm -hmm. of, and, and so I think that with all of these other accounts, which includes my own, um, it's much harder to grow a following because there are so many, um, unless you have a shout out or unless you have a connection to a larger account that, you know, somehow references you. Mm -hmm. And so that's what content zone did for me, um, which at a content zone, which was a pretty cool thing. I actually made a, uh, quite a few friends from people that were regular followers, uh, from just that, that, surge that initial surge of people that were following me from that post of mine that he shared cool um i think that it's kind of like a um a tribal thing you know and it's a a lot of thing a lot of uh, appeal of memes it's not just the fun of laughing at funny images it's also uh you know belonging to a community and when you see oh, oh sure yeah when you see a picture that has a lot of likes uh you see that a lot of of people uh, have found it funny and so if you find it fun if it's funny too uh if you like it too you kind of have the feeling of belonging to that community and uh you know um it, it can um it, it can um uh, in some cases um 
you know, um, I'm, I'm not sure how to, uh, how to say it, but uh, it can, um, you know, evolve into a thing when you kind of doubt your own tastes. Uh, when you see a thing that doesn't have a lot of likes, uh, you see uh, exactly you see it and you see, oh, this is not really popular, but I like it. Is something wrong with me? Uh, am I am I being wrong uh, for liking that? You know, I know that, that it happened to me a, a few times, and um, I know that it happened to it happens to a lot of people. You know, uh, it it feels comforting when you see a lot of people liking the same thing as you. Because um, uh, you're part of the tribe, and uh, you know you ask yourself questions when you like something that is not popular, and I think it is the same thing. Um, also, when you start seeing you know brands and celebrities uh, sharing memes, I think a lot of people hate that because they think that these people are not part of the community, and they see them like they see them as kind of a rival tribe. And sure. you know, uh, appropriating our culture, and um, th that's my theory. Well, I, I, I am in a hundred percent agreement with you. I think that you're absolutely right, because whether whether we like it or not, you know, we are still really tribal creatures, um, and so. Uh, I, you know, for an example, you say, you know, you mentioned that something will influence our opinion based on other people liking it. Um, do you listen? Do you listen to rap at all? Do you listen to any of like the modern SoundCloud rappers? Uh, not really, no. So I didn't really either um, until I got involved with the meme community on Instagram. I started noticing everybody posting about this guy XXX Tentacion. Mm -hmm. I know of him. And yeah, and and so they started it, you know, everybody was sharing little snippets of his song and making memes about him and so on. Mm -hmm. And at the time I was not listening to very much rap music. I had been burnt out on rap for a couple years. And um and then I listened to that song, Look at Me, and it was something like it was something different, you know, than than what I had heard before from rap, you know, it was like distorted and angry and, and kind of, it was cool. And I was like, I, I, I sat back for a second and was like, what the fuck, you know, do, am, do I actually like this? And then I, I realized that I did like it. Um, and of course now, since he died, you know, um, People have been making uh, memes about him and so on, and mm -hmm. and you know he's become less favorable as time's gone on, um, especially with people you know knowing about some of the things that he allegedly did. Yeah. Um, but I still like the music, and that was all influenced by other people, and so I find a lot of the music that I listen to nowadays um, from the internet. Uh, from oh, yeah. Instagram for Me Tame too. Impala, for example. Um, mm -hmm. What's that? There's a there's a French indie group that I've been listening to um, that I found. Here, let me. I found them on Instagram. Um, I think it's I think it's called uh, Poom. So I heard a song called Le Voile. Le Voile. Uh huh. Um, have you heard of them? No. Nope. Yeah, so they're like a French indie group. Okay. And somebody shared a snippet of their song in a meme. And so when I uh, when I looked it up, I was like, holy shit, this is awesome. But but it was kind of like, you know, I wasn't listening to like indie funk, but because other people were sharing about it and so on, it sort of validated the idea that it's okay to like that music, you know? Yeah, yeah, I think it's, uh, yeah, yeah, I think it was the same for me and uh, Migos. I discovered, oh, sure. I discovered them uh, thanks to the raindrop drop, drop top meme. I would have never listened to them if not for this meme. But uh, yeah, I, also I, I saw a parody that was really great. Uh, where where the guys say really random shit and it was so good. 
um, uh, I don't remember exactly, but I've saved it somewhere, and uh, it was it, um, you may you probably seen it, the Migos parody. Um, I, I'm trying to uh, remember the lyrics. I've seen I've seen a few of them. You know, it was a really popular meme back back when. Um, when I think that the song dropped in like 2016, and uh, that was one of I think when I first started looking at memes on Instagram and following meme accounts, that was like one of the earliest things I can remember seeing was a Amigos raindrop drop top meme. If you actually, if you find or if you remember that parody. Send me the link or or tell me the name of the guy who made it because because I want to see if I know it. Um, uh, yeah, oh, I I I I I think that the lyrics was something like uh, OG peanut butter uh, <laughs> band aid girls could cookies or something like that. Uh, oh, God, now I want to now I want to find out who who that is. Um, uh, I think yeah, I think it was like oh yeah, OG peanut butter band aid. Dr. Pepper, uh, girls could cook something. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I remember the lyrics. Oh, I, I remember, yeah. What is it? OG, peanut butter, seafood, honey bottle. <laughs> OG, peanut butter, uh, yeah, seafood. seafood. Is that what you said? Yeah, OG, peanut butter. Seafood, Henny Bottle, Girl Scout, oh, yeah. Girl Scout, Dr. Pepper, Band Aid, I Got the Cheddar. Rap songs don't even make sense anymore yeah, by Yoshi that's, Tree. That's the one. So good. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to listen to it uh, yeah. after we're done with the call because. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. yeah I'm not, I'm I, not, I'm not, I, I know it's a parody made by some small channel but i'm not sure if it's copyrighted or not so let's be safe yeah um i know that it would uh but yeah yeah and so uh, you know go going back to you know that topic i think that uh i think you're absolutely right we are very tribal and we are very influenced by one another mm -hmm. um you know no i think we kind of like to pretend that we aren't But we um, really are, yeah. But we, yeah. Especially um, some people that I see, like, for, for, for example, uh, when people talk about a fandom, there's nothing more tribal than this shit. Uh, when, yeah. When they say, oh, yeah, uh, the, the Rick and Morty fandom ruined the show, you know, uh, uh, it's a good show, but I cannot, uh, I cannot watch it anymore because the fans are so obnoxious. That's the most tribal shit I ever heard in my life. That's crazy <laughs> to me. Yes, yeah, so, rival tribe, uh, enemy tribe like this, so uh, me not like it anymore. It's such a caveman shit. That's, uh, th th that's really funny, in my opinion. Well, okay. Uh, it's, you know, you, you mentioned, Rick, you know, the rival tribes thing. Mm. And this, this, okay. So when I first heard 21 Pilots, do, do you listen to 21 Pilots at all? No. 21 Pilots sort of became big, um, you know, the, have you ever listened to their music? Uh, no, no, I, I've seen the memes, I remember one, uh, I remember one meme that circulated a lot uh, when the, their, um, their album, uh, it was when, it was in 2016, they, they released an album that uh, was kind of successful and uh, uh, it sparked a lot of memes i remember one that uh, was passed around a lot that was the real enemy is not uh, islam or christianity or atheism or judaism the real enemy is 21 pilots <laughs> yeah i mean I, I, i remember seeing this one uh, uh, quite often but uh, no I've, I i've never um really sent to them i actually edited that meme um I took out the 21 pilots part uh -huh. and I edited in an image that was a, um, it was a name tag for someone that worked for Ben and Jerry's, uh, <laughs> ice cream. And okay. at, at the top of the name tag, it said, 
associate manager, but they abbreviated associate to just ASS. <laughs> so it said, so it said ass manager. <laughs> and I forget what the woman's name was that was on the, that was on the name tag. But uh, it said the real enemy is not Islam or Christianity or atheism. The real enemy is ass manager Jennifer or something like that. You know, I can't I can't remember how far back I I did that edit. But, um, you know, I uh, but but speaking of of 21, 21 uh, 21 pilots, um, I first heard their music. In 2015, they came out with this song called, um, shit, what was it called? I, I can't remember. It was a super popular song, and I heard it on the radio, and um, I thought it was all right, you know? Mm-hmm. But as, as, as time went on, you know, that was just a single they released, and then they released an album, and um, the album became really popular uh-huh. but with that developed an insufferable fandom um you know we're talking like 14 13 year old girls that just obsessed over the two guys in the band mm-hmm. um and they would do like those role play memes about them you know they're like imagine if tyler joseph came to your house with a box of chocolates and a, you know, thing of roses, something to that effect. Uh And it made me dislike 21 Pilots, not because of their music, but because of their fandom. Um, And it was a totally subconscious thing. You know, it's just like, I didn't mind their music at all, but I was like, I don't want to listen to the music of a band that, um, that has this insufferable fandom. That is, until um, they just released an album this year called Trench. Um, and do, do you ever watch Anthony Fantano, uh, uh, yeah. the music critic? Yeah, 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 once in a while, yeah. So he, he did a review of the album, and you know he's been really critical of, of 21 Pilots in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, but he gave this album an 8 out of 10. Ooh. Uh, and so I was like, damn, I really got to see what all the fuss is about. And so I listened to it, and it's a wonderful album. Okay. And it also made me realize that that album sort of separated them from their fandom and sort of made their music likable to a wider audience, probably because of Anthony Fantano's review of it. Um, hmm. Or, you know, other people praising the album for being just good music. Yeah. So it, it sort of made it more acceptable for people to like. I think, or, you know, people like me anyway, um, that disliked them in the past. You, you, felt, and, you felt validated because someone that you had respect for uh, uh, said uh, that he appreciated them. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I, I listened, to, which I don't typically do. I like to find songs that I like. A lot of my friends will listen to entire albums. Um, you know, just to see what the entire album's like. But I know that on on an, any given album, there's going to be songs that I like, and there's going to be songs that I'm not a big fan of. Yeah, same. That's I only listen to playlists now that I curate myself, and uh, I, yeah. I rare I rarely listen to a whole album. There are a few albums that I like from uh, start to finish, but they're uh, you know rare. Um, so, like, what what albums are those? But, Give me an example. Uh, Blackwater Park by Opeth. Sure. I didn't know you liked Opeth. That's one of my favorite bands of all time. Really? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm a big fan of prog. And uh, they're just... Uh, I, I love prog rock and I love prog metal also. And they're just at the, the thin blue line between both. And uh, I, I really am a big fan of, of them. Uh, another would be Key by uh, Devin Townsend. I, I've never heard that. I've never even listened to Devin Townsend before. Okay. Uh, well, it's uh, my favorite. My favorite album by Devin Townsend is called Key, and uh, it's also the same. It's uh, not really rock, but not really metal, but kind of in between. You know, uh, it, sure. it it goes hard, but not 
really too much. Uh, I mean, it, it, there's a lot of nuance and a lot of uh, amplitude of sound. There are really soft songs and really hard ones on that album. And uh, this is something that I really love. Same with Blackwater Park, of course. Um, but um, yeah, uh, th there's not a lot of albums that I will listen the whole thing. Um, another one would be Foxtrot by Genesis. Sure, yeah. I've actually heard some songs off of that album, but I I've never heard the whole... I've never listened to the whole thing through and th through and through. There are not a lot. Of, there are not a lot of songs on that album because it's the songs that are quite long. So, <laughs> I think that um, I somebody that I know, if, if my memory serves me correct, linked um, in some of the group chats that I'm in. You know, a lot of people will talk about music, and um, so s someone will link a song from time to time. So. Um, uh, or like an album upload. Uh -huh. uh, so, which speaking, do you listen to other types of metal, or do you like prog metal and prog rock? Uh, I especially, I, I especially like prog, but I also listen to other types. Yeah, uh, I, I listen to 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 grindcore a little. Really? Uh, yeah, bands like uh, my favorite band is it's not really grindcore, but it's a band called Anal Natrach. Uh, they're such a great band. Uh, they're British and they make a, kind of like um, a, a mix of black metal and industrial and grindcore. It's it's it's, um, it's really brutal and, and fast and it's kind of original too. They have a, a, kind of a unique sound. I would recommend them to any metal fan. Uh, but also a band like uh, you know Aborted. Uh, they're pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they're uh, Cryptopsy also from 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 Canada. They're they're nice, and uh, uh, a French band called uh, Ultra Vomi. That's uh, really really nice too. Uh, but uh, yeah, I listen to a lot of different uh, kinds. Um, even uh, even bands like Slipknot. You know, I I, I love Slipknot. Uh, yeah, I, I know that's that, great. I know that. Uh, you know, true metal fans tend to hate them, but I, I don't really give a shit. I'm not, I don't consider myself a metal head, even if I listen to a lot of metal. Uh, I, I, I love Slipknot. I don't give a shit what people say. Um, that's, you know, and uh, Deftones, of course. Uh, sure. Also a band that's on the verge between rock and metal, you know, not really rock, not really metal, on, at the right, uh, really nice for, for everyday listening. Sure. I also wouldn't consider myself a metal head, uh, but I do listen to metal. I have pretty much always listened to metal. So um, I come from Washington State, which is where Seattle is, which is where grunge was born. Uh -huh. You know, bands like Nirv Nirvana came from Washington. Pearl Jam came from Washington. Um I think Alice in Chains came from Washington. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so I grew up listening to grunge, uh, you know, because it got really popular when I was a kid <clears throat> and during the 90s. And, um, and, and so, like, as, as the, you know, as I started to get a little older, uh, my stepdad, was a fan of thrash metal from the eighties. And, and, uh, so we listened to Megadeth and Metallica and, um, and then Slipknot released that first really big single that they came out with. I can't even remember the name of the song, uh, it's probably, but I was like, probably wait and bleed it. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. And, I was like, this, this is awesome. You know, so I went to the CD store and I bought that album, Iowa. Um, and I remember my <laughs> driving in my grandmother's car with that album playing. Um, and she hated the music, you know, and, and I was like, this is awesome. And then, um, I bought another album, which was, uh, uh, metal band that didn't last very long, but they were called Kitty, and they were uh, yeah, I remember, yeah, and so they came out with a song called Brackish that they played a music video on, and I thought that it was pretty cool that there was an all girl metal band. Um, but and then as the years went on, um, 
I became a fan of a Finnish metal band. They're like melodic thrash, or I don't know even what you call them. Uh, Children of Bodom oh, yeah. is what they're called. And uh, I'm still a fan of them today. But as I continued, you know, uh, as I became an adult, I became a fan of bands like Born of Osiris, Chelsea Grin, um, Veil of Maya. Mm -hmm. Those bands, they do like really technical uh, instrumentation, you know, the, the, a lot of double kick, a lot of, uh, you know, tempo and tone changes, a lot of key changes. Um, and I thought, you know, it, it's really difficult strum patterns and I was enamored with it. And so while I think, uh, you know, I'm still a huge fan of Metallica. I'm still a huge fan of grunge. Um, you can't deny I, your uh, roots. Oh yeah. Yeah, but I, I also like a lot of the newer metal that, that comes out, too. Um, speaking of <clears throat> black metal, though, mm -hmm. I've noticed that um, I probably am going to butcher the pronunciation of his name, but Varg Vikernes. Varg Vik yeah, I think, Vikernes. Yeah, I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, you know, he's received like a huge surge in popularity recently. Yeah. Um, When I was on Nine Gag in 2012, people would talk about him, but it was an obscure topic. You know, they talked about a guy who burned churches and killed a guy, and then moved to, and then went to prison and then moved to France. And um, and you know, I was like, ah, oh, he sounds like the epitome of a black metal guitarist, you know. <laughs> um, yeah. But his music now, you know. Um, Uh, I'm, I'm completely spacing on the name of his of his band. Um, uh, yeah. Oh shit! It's, Me too. Uh, That's weird. It's such a famous band. Uh, I know. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He he made that um, that uh, that song war war something. Uh, this is ha huh. wow. Um, uh, let, oh let, shit! Oh, that's ah! Oh, I cannot stand that. It's one of the first. Oh yeah. I had to look it up. I'm ashamed about that, but Burzum. I had to look it up. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that you know, uh, uh the the song Dunkel Height. Mm -hmm. Dun I, I, Norwegian pronunciation is so difficult. Like. I don't know. I, yeah, it's, less, um, it's less difficult that, than uh, Finnish. Oh yeah, Finland, but, Finland I mean, language is uh, is crazy. You know, speaking of the Finnish language, it's it's really interesting that they that it's not an Indo-European language. Yeah. Um, you know, they're uh, a Sami language group, I think, is what they're called. Sort of like Hungarian. How it isn't an Indo-European language. No, it's, it's, um, it's, it's the same family as as Hungarian. I have Finnish and Hungarian as this, have the same origin. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? Like they yeah. both, they both supposedly came from the from. I I want to say that they came from this the Eurasian steppes. Um, at least that's where they assume the Magyars come from. Um, but. I don't know that you know that that sort of ancient European history is something that really intrigues me, mm, um, same. and and I can go on about it. But um, yeah, Dunkel Height came out ten years ago. It was posted to YouTube ten years ago, I should say. I don't know how long the song actually came out, but you know, uh, if you go on YouTube to the song, all of the comments are from this year. Huh? You know, okay. people. It, And and it's just because there's just this been this recent surge in popularity. So I think that you know, Burzum is becoming a classic. Oh uh, yeah, I, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Sort of a classic in in the making. It you know that well probably it probably could be classified as a classic now because yeah. it's a you know the band is probably 20 years old oh, or yeah. older. So uh, anyway. But yeah, no. Um, metal is cool. I like a lot of other genres, uh, but you know, it sort of hark it sort of harkens back to like some music I listen to because people don't like it or, or other people don't like it. Um, 
Whereas some music I listen to because I've, I've sort of, I've heard about it or, you know, it's influenced me in a certain way to start listening to it. Um, and, and, you know, I, it's just interesting how our subconscious mind plays such a role in our active lives and how the internet affects that. Because really, we are we are in contact with so many people, so many more than we would be, yeah. Um, if the internet wasn't a thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, a lot of kids now, you know, teenagers don't. Um, you know, they grew up in. I think, mine. Do you have you ever played Minecraft, or do you play Minecraft at all? Uh, I've played Minecraft for a few hours, uh, almost ten years ago when it first came out. I've never played it. Um, and, you know, I see Minecraft memes every single day. Yeah. And um, that's because I think that a lot the people that are, are sharing and making Minecraft memes are teenagers. Uh, They're I, people that... I what's that? I don't think so. I think that it's uh, people who were teenagers when my, Minecraft... Uh, like boomed like in uh, 2009, 2010 and I, I see now a lot of people who are uh, like nostalgic of the Minecraft era when it was hugely popular and there are people who are like in their uh, mid-twenties and uh, they're uh, kind of like well, yeah, we when, when we were ki ki kids uh, we had the Minecraft it was better than the shitty Fortnite thing that the kids are uh, uh, playing now <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot of people uh, I see making Minecraft memes now are it's it's uh, a lot of them are imbued with uh, yeah nostalgia and and a sense of uh, yeah my generation was better and uh, yeah it's it's just you know that's something that is sort of embedded in you're you're absolutely right and that's the point that I was trying to make is, is that you're nostalgic about things from when you were younger mm -hmm. and so I think that that's why. But, you know, I see it with other video games, too, that I played when I was growing up. Um, I still see memes probably a couple times a week, at least, about Super Mario 64. Um, hmm. yeah, you know, that and... Lot, yeah. yeah, and how old is that game? You know, it, 20 years old? Uh, yeah, now? A, a, bit, a bit more. 22? Yeah. And so, you know, it's... And I think that because it's still relevant, well, uh, that's it, yeah. It's all, the Super Mario memes uh, have been really popular uh, lately, but there, there's a good reason for that. It's because a game. It's a game that has been a uh, uh, really popular uh, with a speedrunning crowd. Uh, oh, sure. Ever since and and uh, even more lately, um, because uh, you know with the internet speed speedrunning, uh, you know people share their. Uh, there, there are things like on Twitch and, uh, and YouTube, and there's a lot of interaction within the community, much more than uh, it used to be. That's how we see new records. Um, uh, uh, this year, a new record uh, has been uh, broken uh, on, on Tetris, a game that is, you know, more than 30 years old. And, yeah. um, and, and, and people are, are finding new ways to be more efficient at Tetris and they they share advice and tips between them. And, and that's how people are, um, you know, uh, more and more people start, uh, uh, being able to go up to level, level 30. If you've played Tetris, the classic Tetris a lot, you know, that it's basically impossible if you don't know a, a few yeah. tricks and have a lot of practice. And, um... Uh, um, where was I going with that? Uh, we were talking about um, oh, Super, yeah, Mario Super, Mario, Super Mario 64. Um, what put Super Mario 64 back on the meme map, uh, I want to say, is uh, well, first, it's the um, you know, the, the, the classic video games are, are cool again from the 90s. Uh, it started with Vaporwave, of course. But then sure. uh, you you had the the um, uh, the the remaster of Crash Bandicoot, which was kind of the rival of Super Mario back in the day of uh, Nintendo sixty four and the PlayStation, and um, also it was that meme from January uh, twenty seventeen or was it December twenty sixteen or it was around there uh, with the Half and Egg Press. 
That was huge. You know? So the guy yeah. who made his crazy video when he explains this it's really, really complicated stuff when Mario goes to parallel universes and all that shit. <laughs> that was... I, I actually, yeah, that was I remember incredible. seeing that video. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I watched it several times. And I don't even know why. I hate speedrunning, usually. I don't know. Yeah. Most of the time, I don't really see the point. But I don't know. The, the, the guy's explanations and the way he talks and the way the video was edited. But first, we need to talk about parallel universes. So, uh, <laughs> and, the, and the QPUs and, uh, you know, and that, that was... Uh, um, that video was a huge hit on Tumblr, especially. And it generated a shit ton of memes there. Um, and... Uh, Less on other platforms, but uh, I'm a, I'm a lot. I spend a lot of time on Tumblr, and uh, I, I saw so many memes uh, of, of that uh, half an A press thing, and that's that's when Super Mario 64 became you know meme uh, again. Uh, it it started then. You know, uh, mentioning that video, that's the one where he talks about running around in a circle to build up speed for like 20 hours, yep. right? Yeah. A friend of mine sent me that, and he said, um, this guy either must have the greatest dedication in the world, or he's got Asperger's syndrome. Oh, yeah, that's exactly you know? what I thought, too. <laughs> because... <clears throat> I went to school with a kid who had Asperger's syndrome and he wasn't, you know, he wasn't very good at being nice or being social or polite, but he was very good at drawing and mm -hmm. he, um, he could draw some of the most intricate and insane pictures and he could concentrate on drawing for hours and hours on end and, and not break his concentration for anything. And so it almost makes me kind of wonder, you know, is he slightly on the spectrum? And that's, that's not me saying that in a rude way. I think it's an oh, yeah, absolute. No, no, uh, no, yeah. yeah what, I what, think that, yeah. When I saw that, you know, that thing, go ahead. Uh, when I saw that video, it was one of my first thought. It was, there is no way that guy is not an autistic, at least a little. <laughs> yeah, because it's like, I don't know a single person, especially, you know, a, an adult that um, that could concentrate for that long or could or could have their undivided attention uh, dedicated to something as mundane as running around um, mm -hmm. that, you know, unless there was something else at play. And so, you know, I commend that guy for being able to do that because that's something I definitely couldn't do. Um, you know, I used to, uh, my friends and I, we would try and see how fast we could beat Mario 64. But it was nothing in comparison to what these guys are doing now. You know, they've been playing it for years and years and they know every nook and cranny. Yeah of the game and you know it's incredible to see i don't spend a lot of time watching speed running but um i have seen it in the past and it's incredible um so you know if if that's what you're into then you know props to you that you can beat super mario 64 in five minutes with your eyes closed you know that's, yeah sure it, um another game did you ever play Final Fantasy at all? Uh, a little, yeah. I remember playing the Final Fantasy VII on, yeah. on the original Hell PlayStation. Yeah. That game, the graphics were fucking terrible, yeah. but the but the actual the, the gameplay and the lore behind it, I think, probably most of all, was really interesting and intriguing. Mm -hmm. So I played... Final Fantasy 7 and I, I played several Final Fantasy games but 7 and 9 were probably my favorite um, and sort of used to do the same thing there where I would try and see how fast I could beat the game but um, anyway you know it, it's uh, another, uh, yeah that, that sort of brings me to another thing um, Twitch streaming you know it uh it's become so insanely popular. Yeah. Um, and it makes absolute sense now. But, you know, if you were to tell somebody 20 years ago or 10 years ago even that 
people playing video games would have a larger audience than live sports. Um, you know, they tell you you were crazy. Yeah, probably, yeah. But it makes sense. I mean, it's kind of the same thing as live sports. Really. It's not it's it's not very different. No, and and that's true. And that and that's why it it uh it makes sense, but you know, like because I think that you know the the interaction is totally different. Yeah. But also kind of the same in a in a different way where like um you know, if you're sitting at a TV or or even more um if you go to a, a football game and by football, I mean, European football, uh-huh. soccer. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, and you go and, and you sit at the bleachers of this game and watch it. You're seeing a tangible thing in action, people doing a tangible thing. Um, you know, and, and, um, so that's a way that it's different, but at the same time, um, you know, when, with live sports, you know, you have sports announcers that, um, you know, you might like or you might not like them. Whereas with the the streaming community, you know, a lot of people will find a streamer that they like. And whether that's a girl with huge tits or whether that's a, a guy with a funny personality or something, you know, watching them play video games, half of it, I think, is the game itself, Uh at least for a lot of people. And then the other half of it is the person playing the game. Absolutely, yeah. Um, isn't that what PewDiePie started out doing? Was uh, No, I don't think he did live streams. Uh, I think he did Let's Plays. It's quite different. Yeah, that, I, that's what I mean. It's more like just gameplay. I don't think that live streaming was huge because PewDiePie's been on YouTube for 12 years or yeah, something. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but um, I think uh, a, a, a thing with um, a lot of esports is that people sometimes uh, can have a direct interaction or almost direct with the streamer. Uh, yeah. like, like they they will type something on the chat and the, the streamer will read it. And so in that way, that makes it uh, even more tangible than people sure. uh, kicking a ball or, uh, you know. Um. And and I guess that that sort of validates it even more that, you know, a streamer that you like just read your message out loud and, and responded to it or whatever, you know, um, it's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of a cool thing. I've, I've gone on live streams on Instagram before and said messages and, and had people read them aloud and it's almost like I'm, it's almost like I'm talking to them. Yeah. Um, and so... That's kind of fun, I guess. And so I guess it, it uh, makes sense that it's so popular. Um, and, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, you know, who knows if... Because I'm pretty sure that live streaming is just as popular as live sports. I, I don't know. Um, I, 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 I mean, that, that would be my guess anyway. But I think that, uh, you know, as time goes on, it, I the popularity is going to continue to grow and, um, and, you know, especially with younger people getting older, you know, and, and this is their sense of familiarity, Mm -hmm. um, you know, is, is they'll, I think that live sports will make, I don't think it'll totally fade out. Um, I, I think that it will just, Because here's the thing is there's always going to be people that are going to play sports. Um, There's always going to be people that, you know, play football or, you know, um, what's that damn British sport that they do where they have a bat and cricket, the cricket. That's it. Yeah, that's Um, that's the, the the most boring thing I ever watched in my life. Was, oh was a match of cricket, I... and uh, and yeah, yeah, it's it was uh, there was like the little sticks, and uh, <laughs> and they hit the ball, and, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, I was at a British friend's house, and his dad was uh, watching this, and I asked I asked the dude, uh, 
because uh, it seemed like really slow and and uh, we went back uh, in the TV room like several hours later and the, the, the dad was still watching like the same match and I was asking for how long has it been going on and he said like three days I good was, lord and I was like what is the fuck is this sport it's one of the, the craziest sport I ever seen of course there are there there are like a lot of really crazy sports like the 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 dudes who run down a mountain uh, running after a block of cheese or uh, those people <laughs> or those people who do the extreme eye running you know sure and I think that they're kind of entertaining in their own way so so you know sports live sports will always be popular but I think that um, the stigma about esports which I think that there used to be a stigma against it you know that it wasn't a real sport yeah. uh, or something like that you know now that's that's totally changed. <clears throat> I mean, and, people watch chess competitions, and he, it has yep. it has been considered a sport for a long time. Uh, uh, esports are even more because you need a lot of practice, you need really good reflexes. I don't see how it's not a sport. I mean, if you know, shooting uh, a target can can be sport, then why esports it, could yeah. not be? You're um, yeah, you're you're absolutely right. Um, I think that there was just a, 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 a stigma against it for a while that, you know, as as people get older, as times change, you know, that, that went away for the most part. Um, you know, I mean, you're still going to have old people that don't understand it, uh, but, you know, they're, they're old now, and uh, shit, I feel old now, you know, and... <laughs> And uh, well, I'm much older than you, so what am I yeah. then? <laughs> but, but yeah, um, uh, I think there's a stigma against you know sitting down. It's weird, but oh sure, I, I see that people who I don't know and and being inside also. Uh, there's there's a a lot of people think that sports are better because people are are outside and they're running and shit. And when you're uh, when you're sitting in a chair, it's not the same. Uh, but that's that's so weird. Um, and I think I think actually that esports bring us back to the roots of live sports, uh, which sure. were, which were the um, the Olympic Games uh, in in ancient Greece. Um, and you know, at the time, you had of course uh, sports like running and shit like that. But also there were there was um, competitions of poetry uh, in the Olympic Games, and it was the uh, poetry was in the Olympic Games for the longest time. I think they removed it less than a hundred years ago. So sure. so for at least two thousand years, uh, it was considered kind of a sports and and worthy of being included in in the competition and and being you know performed live and. Uh, uh, there were judges that that would give a, a score, and th uh, that's. Um, uh, I think that there's a lot of. Um, I don't know. Uh, um, I, I I I don't exactly know what parallel I was going to do with that, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we, we are well. No, I I. Speaking of of that, you know, or, or or parallels, you mentioned chess earlier, yeah. and chess is something that you sit down yeah. with. You have to concentrate. You have to anticipate the opponent's moves. It's the same premise as video games. It's just an analog game by comparison to a digital game. Yeah. And so, I mean, when you're playing football or tennis or rugby, you also have to concentrate a lot and to anticipate your opponent's moves. Yeah. Yeah, and so I um when with with video games, you know, I you're going to realize or I think the the world has realized that it is a, a tangible real sport now and especially with like large esports competitions um you know some of the prizes that they're winning are you know massive amounts of money mm. and that sort of lends some validity to it alongside of the fact that it's more socially accepted now and that's because people realize that a lot of people support it um 
uh, you know, and, and so I think that even people that don't play video games, um, so, you know, they realize that, that it's a thing that a lot of people like to do. A lot of people enjoy it. So, you know, it's a, it's a valid real thing. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, um, yeah, I kind of forgot where I was going with that outside of the fact that, you know, just that it's a, uh, that it's something that's changed that I've noticed has changed. Um, <clears throat> anyway. Yeah. Uh, so video games are, are becoming more and more part uh, of popular culture. And, uh, you know, um, when I was a kid, it used to be, um, a thing that's only for, you know, nerds and, um, or, or little kids. And, and um, it, it changed quite fast. It changed basically when the PlayStation came and there were games sure. games like um, Tomb Raider, Resident Evil, or uh, Gran Turismo that I, I saw a lot of adults playing. Um, I think one of the first celebrities that, uh, that, that came out of the closet as a gamer uh, was Pharrell Williams. Who was uh, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. He was really hip at the time. Uh, he was uh, he was in a band that literally was called Nerd, um, and also he, oh. he, and also he was in a in a producing uh, duo called the Neptunes. Uh, they made a lot of songs like Oh yeah, Brit okay. Britney Spears Toxic or uh, Snoop Dogg's um, uh, the, the 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 minimalist song Snoop Dogg's uh, Drop It Like It's Hot. And, sure. And uh, and so uh, yeah 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 he he was one of the first celebrities to uh, um, with uh, to come out as a, a gamer and uh, he uh, he had a band called Nerd and one of the the I think the first uh, album's uh, cover was Pharrell Williams playing uh, PlayStation and um, really yeah 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 yeah, yeah. and um, that that changed a lot of uh, and. Um, More and more now we see uh, uh, people, uh, uh, you know, uh, playing, you know, uh, I remember Robin Williams, who was a big fan of Zelda, uh, or uh, he even named his daughter Zelda. Yeah, I was, was going to say that. His daughter's name is Zelda. Or um, who, who, whom else am I thinking of? Um, I mean, whatever. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's becoming you know a thing that everyone does, and the people who were kids in the '90s, where there was the big um, um, the big two, uh, the Super Nintendo and the Mega Drive, which which made video games popular with every kids. Every kids wanted to play Mario or, or or Sonic in the '90s, and well, we're adults now, and uh, so yeah. There is not really a stigma against video games anymore. It has kind of disappeared. Uh, you can you can see in some niche cultures like SJWs that think that every video game is sexist or or whatever they think, or uh, you know uh, people from the far right who, who thinks that uh, video games are uh, you know satanic or uh, a tool of communism or whatever Nazi thinks. Uh, and but for the overwhelming majority of people. It's just a normal thing to do, you know. Some people go to cinema, some people game, some people listen to music. Who gives a shit? It's it's a, a totally normal thing now, and the stigma against it has completely vanished. I, I don't see I don't see it anymore. Um, and uh, so uh, because of that, I, I don't. Uh, that helps esports becoming popular, um, probably because everyone. Uh, Pretty much everyone games now. I mean, even your mom probably plays Candy Crush on her phone, and um, it's uh, such a, an everyday, normal thing from for everyday people to do now. That um, the only stigma that I see is the lack of physical activity involved. Um, sure, and that. I, I know that a lot of people are uh, are having a problem because of that, and that's kind of weird. But um, I, I, yeah, it's, I see uh, a lot of people that play video games all the time that are fit. 
You know, yeah, I think it's it's based on personal activity and personal responsibility. So, you know, the same people that might judge someone for sitting down for four or five hours at a time to play a video game, they might sit down for four or five hours to read a book. Yeah. You know, you're not getting any physical activity when you're sitting reading. Um, or, you know, so, so you know, I, I the trend is going to continue where people are just more and more accepting of it. And that's how... Ever, that's how innovations work, though, is there's always people that doubt it. And there's and then eventually, you know, if it turns out to not be a bad thing, um, it'll continue to be more accepted. But, uh, you, you know, you mentioned SJWs. Um, you know, I live near Seattle, which is a very liberal city. Mm-hmm. Um, and I used to s- sort of halfway live in Seattle. Um, my, my girlfriend lived in North Seattle, um, and I would spend half of the week there and then I would travel back to, you know, I would travel West, uh, for work during the week. Mm-hmm. Um, and during the time that I was there, you know, because you're always seeing on the news, uh, you know, not only am I close to Seattle, but I'm also close to Portland, Oregon, which is one of the most liberal cities. And and, and by saying liberal, I don't mean, you, you know, the ones that are associated with these, you know, crazy SJWs. Uh-huh. But the entire time that I lived in Seattle, I didn't see a single protest. Um, and. You know, and and but so I would see on the internet all the time, you know, about some nut job, you know, screaming about this or some nut job. And then I realized a lot of that is just on the internet. And you get 10 times the reaction uh, that you do for saying something crazy and, and ridiculous. So somebody comes out and I remember seeing this screenshot of a of a Tumblr post that said, "I don't hate men. I just believe all men should die for the sake, you know, so women can feel safe." Mm-hmm. Um, or no, it's not mis it's not misandry, misandry. I don't know how the word's pronounced. Misandry, I think. Um, it's not misandry if I want to kill all men. I just want to keep women safe, and. I was like, that's the most ridiculous shit I've ever read, you know. Uh, And then I realized that's one person's opinion. And I don't know how many thousands of people have shared that, you know, uh, and not not share their opinion, but share the screenshot of that post saying, you know, what a ridiculous idiot, you know. And so it really I think it really inflates the, the idea of how many of these people there are. Definitely. I think that there are far fewer than are being represented. And that. The same thing goes for people that are far right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, There are far, at least in my opinion, I don't have any statistics, but I think that there are far more rational people than there are crazy people that have crazy political opinions. But both sides try to pin the label on each other. So um, have you ever seen like a PragerU do you know what Prager U yeah, is? Yeah, yeah. So you have you seen their ads, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So one thing I always notice is that they make these really big, broad generalizations about the left um, in saying things like, you know, uh, the left believes that, you know, God is useless. The left believes this or that or the other. And but then you actually go talk to people that consider themselves leftists and a lot of times they're like, well, no, I believe this, but I also believe this. And that's because humans are far more complicated, even though we like to put a, a label on it. Yeah. And so, you know, anyway, so I think that that really also kind of inflates the idea that the sort of pitched battle between the right and the left about... Um, yeah, that's so, that's so dumb. I am, I'm pretty right wing myself, but I, I've met a lot of left wing people and I've, uh, I've got, I have a lot of left wing friends and I know by experience that there's, 
there's no one who has a more different uh, worldview than a, a left wing person than another left wing person. They, they, <laughs> these people could debate themselves for days. Uh, I, right. I, it, it's between the socialists and uh, the the liberal um, libertarian left, like the hippies and shit, and and the communists and uh, all the people who are in between. And, you know, there are so many different currents and they believe so much different things than, you know, just saying the left. Yeah, it's it's kind of weird. When when they say the left, yeah, they usually mean uh, this small fraction, this very specific group that represents probably one person of the left and that we don't like. And that they say this specific thing at this specific time. And um, it's... Uh, it's uh, a lot of people want to simplify things uh, because it, it I don't know it it's comfortable or it makes them feel safe to uh, being able to generalize uh, because I don't I, I'm not, I'm not sure why but yeah it's it's like we say uh, it's like we say in France uh, seeing a swallow doesn't mean it's spring you know uh, it means that just because someone does a thing doesn't mean it's a general trend. And um, it's a, that's a really good phrase. I've never heard that before. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's a it's a proverb here. And um, yeah, yeah, to, just some people will, will see three assholes on Twitter or, or Tumblr or, or Reddit uh, voice a, a crazy opinion, and there will and there will be like, oh, that's what they believe, and uh, if the, these three people believe that, then uh, all, all, all everyone else must believe that. Uh, because uh, you know, um, it's um, it's uh, I think just like the tribal thing that we we were saying uh, at the beginning. Uh, it, there's a there's real need for people to believe that we all be belong in communities, and it's good to have friendly communities, and it's also good to have enemy communities, uh, because it helps define yourself by by antagonizing them. Sure. It's um, it, it's it's a comfortable thing. It's um, you know, it, it's a kind of laziness of the mind, uh, I guess. But uh, I guess that I think it also kind of harkens back to you know we talk about the tribal thing. Um, people will make stereotypes about other people, um, about other people groups that they can't relate with, mm -hmm. and that's never gonna. I don't think that's ever gonna change. I mean, maybe it will. But um, I, we do that because, you know, 10,000 years ago, um, your tribe, um, you know, might see someone from my tribe and they'll, you know, I'll be an unfamiliar people. And so, you know, you observe them for a little bit and then you make sweeping generalizations about their behavior. So that way, you know, whether you're in danger or not. Or you know what to expect if my tribe were to attack yours or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that carries on into modern, you know, in, into the modern human mind that we see people and we'll make a generalization or a stereotype about that, that person. And so it's the same with politics, especially since politics have become such an inflammatory thing. Yeah. Um, that, you know, we will make these generalizations because we want to know what dangers to expect from them. Um, and and so, you know, like you said, I, I guess I'd consider myself probably more right than left. Um, but, you know, I've met a lot of really rational, really well-thinking um, leftists that have, yeah. uh, that have helped make me I, I guess I wouldn't even say I'm I'm more right. I guess I'd say I'm probably pretty centrist, given that I'm open to a lot of ideas and my opinions are my own. You know, so so anyway, not to get into that, but it, um, you know, I, I think that that's why we do that. Is it's just it's an old defense technique um, that has carried on into the modern human psyche. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I think that uh, to to elaborate on what you were, were just saying, I think it stems a lot from uh, the echo chambers, and people uh, tend to uh, consciously or not uh, uh, put themselves in. 
and um, uh, a lot of people tend to, you know, uh, it's uh, on, on our in our uh, modern society we tend to have kind of stressful lives, and um, we have a lot of, you know, um, uh, it with social media and, and stuff like that, you know, Facebook, Twitter, and, and all that. We we get a lot of information uh, uh, every day, and so because of that, uh, people tend to filter more um and you know uh, try to listen to only things that they like because because i, I mean I, I get it it's better when you're following people on on you know reddit or uh, not, not reddit but uh, twitter or, or or facebook you you want to interact more with people that that you like and that post thing that you like and because of that um echo chambers are are becoming kind of a, a problem and uh, i know that uh I used to be kind of not really far right, but but kinda kind of radicalized. Uh, uh, and uh, the more and more uh, you interact with people with different opinions, the more uh, you realize that their opinion is uh, nuanced, and sure. that uh, they have valid points, even if you disagree with them on broad um, lines. There are a lot of points that they can bring up that you realize that oh I didn't think about it this way oh maybe they're right uh, on this and that and uh, interacting with a lot of people uh, all over the political spectrum made me if anything more indifferent about politics because I realized yeah. that, that it doesn't matter that much then also, exactly. also that opinions are, are fleeting and a lot of opinions are superficial. It's people that it's things that people like to believe, but they haven't thought about it that much, and they stuck with that belief because nobody really challenged it. Because people tend to leave a lot of in echo chambers, uh, or they also tend to not listen to things that don't go their way. It's it's a natural thing of the human mind to be a reticent to. Uh, uh, you know, uh, internalize uh, dissenting opinions. It, it's, it's a normal thing. And, um, and uh, yeah, yeah, the more you learn, the more you become, I guess, chill about politics and, and indifferent, and the more you gravitate towards the center, I guess. Uh, but but, th but that's, exact, that's exactly, exactly what my, my transformation into my current political set of opinions is um, when I was in high school, you know, I had these sort of dreamy, uh, more left wing oh, yeah. opinions about what the world should be like, you know, and how things should operate and so on. And, and so I had a couple opinions that were considered right wing, but you know, I, I called myself a leftist or I called myself a liberal. I didn't know much about politics. I just had ideas. Mm -hmm. And then as I got older um, and I started working and I, I started uh, my business and, and um, you know, I was, I, I was beginning to realize that the world isn't what I thought it was when I was in high school. It's uh, quite a bit different. So my opinions changed and they started – and they started to, you know, support sort of the, I realized that a lot of the things I used to think didn't make sense. And, um, and then I remember on Facebook, I would, I was young and I had the energy to, I definitely don't know, but I had the energy to post a status about, you know, some political opinion of mine. And then someone would comment and they, you know, call me an idiot and, mm -hmm. you know, we'd yeah. argue back and forth. Yeah, yeah. The thing is, is that about I realized eventually all that Facebook arguing was doing nothing but wasting the energy of me and the energy of the person that didn't agree with me um, because neither of us changed our minds. You know, the, there wasn't any actual careful thought. There was just you felt like you were backed in a, into a corner almost. Um, I mean, when yeah, but somebody. I think it's a really. I think uh, I guess I guess you were a teen at the time because to have the energy to to voice political opinions on the on the internet you you have to be really young because uh, it, it it becomes exhausting really really fast but it's really immature 
a thing uh, that you view debating as a way to change your mind or to change the other person's mind. The, the whole purpose of debating is to try, try and, and convince uh, people who are, you know, who don't have an opinion, who are uh, on the fence, uh, people who already have an opinion. You, you won't change their opinion through a debate. That's basically impossible, and that's a really naive and childish way to look at uh, debating. Uh, the, the point of debating is to, is to have an audience of people who are undecided and to help them, uh, uh, you know, choose their, their side. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I um, and and so you know, whereas the I think the arguments that I was having, ooh, they were pretty. I don't know if you'd call it superficial or not, but it was just it was young people that you know. Yeah, they had their they had their opinions, sterile, and I guess, and that's and that's what we were stuck with, and. Um, and then as time went on, I became friends with and grew close with people who had a slightly different set of opinions than myself. And um, and that sort of, one, it made me realize that, um, it, like you said, it made you sort of indifferent, indifferent towards politics. It made me realize that politics aren't everything, you know. Yeah. Um, where like I used to think that politics were everything. I used to think that um, politics were. We all do at some point, I guess. Yeah, yeah. It. Uh, I, I hit a point where I went. You know what? I mean, with each new president or each new prime minister, um, you know, how much has my life changed? Yeah, exactly. Not very much. Exactly. And um, so. I think a big part of that is the hype. Um, yeah. You know, oh, this bill is going to pass. This is how it's going to affect you. And, you know, that's sort of media doing that, I think. And, and then, you know, uh, and then, of course, people on the Internet also don't don't help. Um, and and so when, you know, uh, for example, how many people – by the time that Trump was elected, I had kind of, you know, already come to the realization that really nothing was going to change. You know, yeah, it's, it's just uh, a different. It's it's the the boy who cried wolf effect. You know. Yeah. They they, they keep saying, it, oh, if uh, this person gets elected, it's going to be catastrophic. Uh, there's going to be blood in the streets. Uh, everyone will is going to die of starvation, and uh, you know, floods will ravage the earth, and. Uh, you know, if this person gets elected, it's going to be World War Three, and uh, it's the it's a thing that we hear all the time, uh, for from the, from the media, uh, the the mainstream media, and from a lot of people on the internet, and so you hear that so many times that it's exactly like the boy who cried wolf. Uh, you don't you become completely jaded to that, and uh, the 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 bad thing about that is that the the time when uh, when there will be a really dangerous person, uh, we won't listen. Because you know, we, it's hard to give a shit anymore when uh, we, <laughs> we we were warned so many times about you know uh, globally inoffensive things or or people, and that turned out to be you know just a wet fart, and um, yeah, and, and you know because of that, it's it's really when when you get interested in politics, you hear these uh, outlandish things a thousand times a day. And it's hard not to become completely indifferent and detached from it because of the exposure to blatantly wrong predictions that keep piling up day after day. Exactly. And um, so that that's sort of another big contributing factor towards my sort of a difference toward politics. And I was actually just having this conversation not too long ago with uh, my friend Onion Pepsi that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, um, he was saying that, you know, it it's gotten to the point where he doesn't really give a, a shit about politics. And, and I, you know, and I was like, hey, I feel exactly the same way because I feel like if something... And this is this is just what I feel like. I don't know exactly how I'd react, but I feel like if something big, something truly, you know, dangerous were about to happen, um, hopefully we would have the insight to be able to see it beforehand and try to prevent it. 
you know, not not allow uh, another Hitler or another Stalin or something like that. Um, but the problem is, is that when Obama was president, people kept calling him Hitler oh, or yeah. they kept calling him Stalin. Yeah. And they do this. They do the same with whoever's president. You know, they try to liken them to these monsters of history. Yeah. And um, and what it, it that absolutely ties into what you're saying, um, that it desensitizes you to what could actually be a legitimate threat. Totally. Because everything is a threat yeah um and <clears throat> that makes you want to distance yourself from the from having a holding a political opinion because it feels pointless sometimes you know it, it, yeah, at yeah, least yeah. to the, me it, it makes the the whole idea of, of a threat seem fake after a while yeah. and uh People keep saying, oh, this person will be like the new Hitler. This person will be like the new Hitler. After a while, it, it seems like, well, they, it makes you think that they cannot be a new, a new Hitler. And and, and they, it, it, of course it can. Of course it can happen again. Um, and it probably will. Uh, but uh, nobody will see it coming. Right. Yeah. And so anyway, you know, it's just... Um... I don't know. It's a mess. And I guess the thing that bugs me the most about that is, is probably the media itself, um, because it's it's doing a kind of malicious thing. Um, and you know why they're doing it is not because they have a, a dedication to telling the truth to yeah. the masses. What it is, is it's for ratings. Yeah. Um, and so they have to be That, or I don't. They don't have to be, but they are. They are being uh, tools for sensationalism, yeah. where they will, you know, tell you the craziest shit, you know, and then so that way it gets people. It it works for both sides. You get people that agree with what they're saying, and they'll watch the news. And then you get people that disagree, that get pissed off about it, and then they'll go watch the news to react to it. Exactly. And And so what that does is when they say something crazy, they get good ratings. And so that's why, and, and you know, it's absolutely, uh, Trump especially, you know, he's kind of an outlandish character. Um, people, all, all American news media, that's all that they talk about is Trump still to this day, because that's that's a huge selling point for people. You have such a, a, a divided, uh, you, you have a wedge driven, you know, down the middle of this country socially where you have people that support him and you have people, you have people that, or I, I should say, it seems like you have people that support him through everything, no matter what he does. And then you have people that vehemently despise him. Whereas, yeah, exactly. That, that, that's why it, that's why it's so bad. Uh, to have strong opinions and convictions about things, because if you have a strong opinion about something, you, you are automatically a cuck. You're you're cucking yep. you're cucking yourself. That's that's uh, that's, that's what they say. Uh, the e the easily offended are easily manipulated. And uh, yeah. if you have a strong opinion about something, then you you're bound to have a strong emotional uh, re reaction when some things goes either your way, so you feel like this overwhelming joy, or not your way, then you feel anger or fear. And uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially in our day and age, uh, it's so such a bad thing to have strong opinions. Uh, because you are manipulated by the media, by the politicians, by every activist group there is. And uh, whether it's one way or another, and you end up being just like uh, what the, what they call the, the useful idiots, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, you know. Yeah, I... I um... Indifference in our day and age is the most powerful weapon that you can have, you know? I, yeah, I feel that, you know, I feel that exact way because here's, here's how I look at it. If you're indifferent towards it, you're rational towards it. I mean, maybe that's not a general law, but it seems like, you know, if you don't have 
super strong, uh, you know, unshakable opinions about something, right? Um, say, for example, um, you know, I'm trying to think of a good example. So, so say, for example, the UK gets a new prime minister and, and this guy, new prime minister, seems like a, you know, like somebody that could be a, a warmonger, um, you know, somebody that has a strong opinion, they're either going to support him or they're going to hate him. And the people that are going to hate him are the ones that are going to be every single time he sneezes, you know, they're going to be saying he's committing a war crime. Yeah. Whereas the people that support him, yeah. um, they're going to be praising him. The people that are middle of the road, the people that are rational are going to be able to look at it and analyze it and go, okay, is this actually something we should be worried about or not? Exactly. Um, and you know, that, that sort of, uh, I think, yeah, that you're absolutely right that that being indifferent or or having a, sort of a middle of the road ideal about reactionary politics um, is is a really good thing to have in this day and age when it seems like half half of everybody's in an echo chamber. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And everything goes fast. You don't really have the time to think about things because you get submerged by information constantly. So, so it's hard to really stop and think. And, uh, you know, and, and a lot of things are driven by emotion because, uh, you, because it's faster to digest and because it drives more engagement, whether it is from people who agree or who disagree with you. And so, of course, in this day and age, if you don't give a shit, you automatically have the high, high ground. You have the power. And if you have strong opinions and strong convictions, you're, you're turning yourself into a cattle for, for, for the mass media uh, butcher shops. Yeah. And I, and I see it. I, I mean, I, I really see it. I, I, mean to, um, I mean to say slaughterhouse, not butcher shop, but you get the idea. <laughs> well, I mean, it, I see it in person. Um, all the time, you know, not just, not just on the internet. Um, for example, my, my landlords, um, they are huge fans of CNN and they watch CNN religiously. Um, you know, and, um, I, I'm pretty close with them, but, you know, I see them, they'll watch a news story on CNN and they'll take it as absolute fact. You know, and so sometimes I will say, you know, um, OK, so then do you really think that's true? And I said, do you think that's 100 percent true? And I'll say the same thing about Fox News, you know, yeah. um, because they're a media company just like the rest of them. I don't care if they're right wing or, or left wing, you know, in order to sell their product and and to charge as much as they can for advertising. Um, they have to have good ratings. And yeah. so in order to have good ratings, they, they have to tell you crazy shit. Absolutely. And so they'll take 10% of the truth and spin it as a hundred percent of the truth with the, with a, a nod to the, to the demographic that they're trying to sell towards. Um, and so these people will, you know, the, and, and so my landlords are CNN's demographic. They're the people that will watch the news and go, oh, well, you know, this happened or, or that happened. Um, you know, I remember just recently, you know, there was that Turkish guy that got murdered. Um, you know, it's a big news story. Some, uh, I think he was a Turkish ambassador to Saudi Arabia or something. And so he he got murdered. They still haven't found his body. Right. Um, immediately CNN says Saudi Arabia that did it, you know, the, the, the King, the Saud or Saud kingdom, uh, is responsible for his murder. And, you know, if you can look at it, you can go, okay, maybe that's the case. Maybe that's not the case. We don't know. I'm not, you know, I wasn't there. I I've never been to Saudi Arabia. Um, you know, I've never been to Turkey. I don't know any of these people. What, you know, the truth is somewhere in between there. And so immediately my, you know, they went, 
oh, those damn Saudis, you know, they're killing people. And, uh, you know, they took it as absolute fact immediately. And I was baffled by it. To be fair, they are. The, the, the war they're waging on Yemen is, is pretty brutal. Uh, for, oh, yeah. For, no, I'm, you know, how many Yemenis are, are due to die from starvation? You know, I mean, the thing is, is that the U.S. protects them. They protect Saudi Arabia because they're an ally and because we buy a lot of their oil. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, it's a screwed up system. Yeah. You know, it, it absolutely is. And I'm not defending the Saudis in any way. Um, no, but as a matter of fact, it, it's stupid to generalize. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's absurd in, in, in every. And, um, but yeah, yeah. But even, even when, when you're not talking um, about politics, I remember um, a, a few months ago, though, uh, but it was uh, almost a year ago, actually. It was, I, I don't know if you know what CES is. Hmm. CES? Yeah, it's a big, um, it's, it's a big um, convention for uh, technology professionals that, to talk about the newest uh, evolution in, in computers and uh, stuff like that uh, in, in Las Vegas. And okay, uh, it's sure. every year and a lot of people uh, are, are there. You know, there are people who make CPUs, CPUs GPUs, uh, uh, even people who make, you know, fans. PC cases, uh, there's a, a, a lot of things like that, servers, uh, SSDs, all, all the professionals are there to showcase their latest uh, tech, and, and there are a lot of tech journalists that are there. And so um, uh, I, I remember um, that um, um, there, were, there was um, a, a video where... Um, some dude, I think it was the the guy from um, Unbox Therapy. Uh, he made yeah. a, he made a video uh, with with all the top technology YouTubers who were there for the event. They all gathered in a hotel room, and he asked them all, uh, "What's your favorite smartphone?" You know, and and a lot of people uh, are were strong advocates of Android. And a lot of people were strong advocates of Apple. You know, it was kind of divided 50-50. And uh, there was the, this guy that I loved, because Linus Sebastian, uh, mm -hmm. who said, uh, I, I, don't, I don't really care. I don't really have, <laughs> have a favorite. Um, now I'm using this Samsung phone, but before I was using an iPhone. And I don't know, next month, I maybe we'll be using an, a, a Pixel or a OnePlus. Or I, I don't really care. Phones are phones. And a lot of people uh, were saying in the comments, oh, he's the smartest one. He doesn't pick a side. So people know that it's bad to pick a side and that it, having strong opinions makes you dumb. And that uh, <laughs> not choosing... Uh, not not choosing a side, you know this this mentality of if you're not with us, you're against us. This crazy tribal shit, this this caveman retarded mentality, you know. Oh of, yeah, it's either with us or against us. You you cannot be on the fence. Uh, the middle ground is as fake. Whereas uh, morality is ninety nine percent fake shit and and gray area, and most of the lines are blurred. And, um, and yeah, yeah, people know that when you pick a side, uh, you know, I, I see it all the time in the Apple versus Android uh, debate. Uh, well, I, I see a lot of people saying that uh, picking a side uh, makes you retarded because Android has some good and some bad and Apple has some good and some bad. And they're pretty equivalent if you really are uh, objective. And um, I, I don't see enough people doing that with, with politics where it would be even better than, uh, I, I mean, Androids or, or iPhones are not going to, uh, you know, are not going to really, it's not going to really, really make a real difference if you pick Android or Apple. But it can be a real difference if you pick some president or some other one. I mean, in today's climate um, and, and politi politics where every political party looks and 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 uh sounds more and more like each other it won't but probably in the future it, it's going to change because it's all cycles so um yeah 
Um, yeah, uh, it's in in the Android versus iPhone debate. Um, I have had two Android phones, three three Android phones, um, and I have had three iPhones. Uh-huh. Um, I try to make my phones last a long time, I've, and. Um, you know, one thing I notice about the Androids is that they're very customizable. Um, whereas with the iPhones, I find that it's a pretty user-friendly yeah. I- I- interface, exactly. you know, that, that you're working with. And it's pretty, you know, it's it's uh, probably more appealing to, you know, just regular people. Whereas Android, you know, is probably more appealing to tech-savvy individuals, you know. And, and the thing is, is that um, it is... is you know, picking a side about something as innocuous as a phone is unnecessary. And when it comes to politics, you know, um, you're exactly right that people choosing a side, people, you know, purposefully picking a side and then refusing to stray from that side um, is is nuts because it's not going to help anything. You know, one side isn't going to completely destroy the other. Yeah. That's it's never worked. It's never worked. Um, you know, even in extreme cases of people, you know, that that have tried to do like ethnic cleansing and shit, you know, it just it's never completely destroyed the opposition. And and, you know, you'd think that they'd learn from history, but apparently people are, are so infatuated with their opinions that they refuse to. Yeah, but, and um, even even worse. Uh, sometimes I see uh, people saying, uh, "Oh, you know uh, this uh, this person," and, and it's often it's often in politics. Uh, you know this um, candidate. Uh, he says that, but 10 years ago he says he said a different thing. So uh, uh, you know uh, he's not he's flip flopping. Uh, he's not. No, he changed his mind. You know, it's a sign of health. Uh, to change right. your mind, it's a sign that he was presented with new information, and so uh, he changed his mind accordingly. P- people think it, people try to enforce the fact that you should have an opinion and stick with it your whole life, whether it, it they don't realize that it means being brain dead. Basically, it's it's like right. it's like yeah. you're stuck in, in some kind of uh, you know necrosis. Uh, and uh, you know, if, uh, actually, if someone has an opinion, and uh, I meet them ten years later, and the, and I have the exact same opinion, I wouldn't trust them, and you probably wouldn't either. Yeah. Uh, people who who are exactly the same uh, ten years later—that's crazy. That's that that's the form of death. And, yeah, um, it seems it seems like it would be extreme, like almost cultish like behavior. Um, but to... but people but people say that shit all the time that uh, oh yeah you see uh, that that guy uh, well uh, 15 years ago uh, he said a different thing uh, so uh, he's completely unreliable uh, he doesn't know what he what he what he wants and uh, what he thinks and uh, you know uh, he's flip flopping uh, he's uh, a and that, that, that's crazy that's crazy I've noticed a lot of people do that with. Um... Obama and Clinton, um, you know, because back in like 95, I think it was, uh, Bill Clinton said, you know, oh, we are a nation of immigrants, yet we're also a nation of laws. So we got to enforce border security, Um, you know, and obviously talking about Mexico. Mm -hmm. And then Obama, when he was running for president, he said, you know, uh, I I welcome any immigrants that come to this country legally, um, but we also need to enforce our border to prevent illegal immigration. And, you know, okay, so that was back in 2007, I think, you know? Mm-hmm. And then people go, well, during Obama's presidency, he pardoned every illegal immigrant. And... You know, maybe he believed that was the right thing to do, but also how massively expensive would it be to deport 11 million people, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and the other thing is, it's like how we have done more than one pardoning of illegal immigration. Uh, I think we've done like four or five 
in the 20th century. Uh, I could be wrong on that, but we've done a few Mm -hmm. where we just pardoned everybody. You know, you're allowed to stay. That's fine. Um, So Obama's not the only guy to do it. But, you know, people like to use that. And it's the same thing with, you know, um, with any political candidate, I guess. But um, but, you know, uh, here's something, you know, because because I kind of I guess I have sort of this odd I don't know if it'd be odd, uh, but, you know, I, I'd sort of think about the media tactics a lot. Uh-huh. And I have a lot of I have a lot of European friends. Um, and, you know, uh, I growing up in the U.S., <clears throat> I had no idea that this was the case until I got older, you know, and I started talking to people from around the world on the Internet. Um, and so when I was in high school, when I was year 12 in high school, mm-hmm. I, um, became friends with a girl, a Russian girl named Daria. And, <clears throat> you know, uh, I told her the type of music I listened to and, you know, this, that, and the other. And she shared a lot of the same opinions as me, um, about, you know, music taste and food and this, that, and the other. Mm-hmm. And, so I remember one time, and her and I have been in contact ever since, you know, we've, we've been friends for years. Uh, but, you know, she one time told me, she said, well, American media is everywhere. So, you know, um, that there's no escaping it. Yeah. And that baffled me because I was like, are you serious? You know, we, we're a country, you know, how, however many thousands of kilometers away from you. And you know, still we're selling American shit in Russia. Um, we're selling American brands in Russia. And then, so, um, I noticed a lot of, you know, I have a lot of intrigue with other countries and other cultures and so on, but I noticed that none of my European friends were ever asking me questions about the U S and, um, so one of my friends told me one time, he said, well, that's because we've got more information about the U.S. than we'd ever fucking need. Yeah, that's true. And and so the, what I wanted to ask you is because because I think and this is just, you know, my opinion, but I think that the U.S. should really scale back its absolute media monopoly over the entire world and branding monopoly, too, because it's I think it's beginning to choke out individual culture. Um, well, that's what people. What do you think that, about that? That's what people say all the time, and I, I don't necessarily agree. But yeah, I've heard that my whole life. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, they made a law that uh, you you could not uh, uh, play too much uh, American music on the radio. There, there were quotas that had to be put in place because some uh, radio stations only played. Uh, uh, foreign music, so uh, the, the, um, there was quotas that were that were put in place um, hmm. uh, to to uh, to, to uh, force radio stations to uh, play at least fifty percent of French music uh, uh, during the day. Uh, there, there was, you know, also uh, tomato tomato ketchup that was banned in school um, and uh, stuff like that. You know, um, and people who are against. Um, Hollywood movies and, and blockbusters being used as a pe- pejorative term. Uh, I, I've heard that all my life, and people who are against, you know, uh, English words and, and all that, and, all, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, I don't really agree with that. It, it's kind of like the it's kind of like the dominant sentiment here, uh, with uh, also both uh, extremes of the political spectrum being strongly uh, against uh, um, America. Uh, the uh, sure. the um, the far right is against it because it's uh, you know it it endangers the the, um, the French identity. The, yeah, the purity of the French identity, and the the far left hates it because it's uh, it's a symbol of capitalism and big corporations and uh, you know that, all that. And, and so sure. uh, I I I have seen uh, McDonald's and KFCs being destroyed a bunch of times. Uh, either by uh, uh, far right people or by far left uh, people, and really, uh, oh yeah, that happens sometimes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Huh. Um, Mac McDonald's or or KFCs or you know these symbols of um, of American influence. 
um, get get routinely uh, trashed uh, either by by communists or uh, or by uh, uh, you know uh, people from from the other side, and um, I've seen protests you know against uh, American imperialism uh, uh, to for for uh, less Hollywood movies, uh, less uh, f uh, American fast food. Uh, um, get get out! Uh, yeah, Yankees go home. I remember it was a huge <laughs> was a huge slogan uh, when I was a, when I was a kid. People would would tag that, uh, you know, would be the graffiti Yankees go home on 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 stuff like Foot Locker and uh, and um, and Nike stores and, and, and yeah, Mac McDonald's is is usually a, a big uh, a target of anti American hate and uh, sure, yeah. Uh, more as uh, as um, as a lot of time uh, uh, goes on, I I don't know if if people like it. Then you know, I mean, it it won the cultural battle fair and square. Uh, I I don't see why it should be banned or uh, or, or 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 whatever. I, I I don't see how it's cheating. Uh, people are saying that it's cheating because, uh, yeah, in in America they have more money and they have more budget for advertisement and and that. So, uh, so uh, you know, uh, it destroys. Uh, um, you know, Amazon is destroying the bookstores and and all that. Uh, there was a huge movement against Amazon a few years ago, where people saying uh, go buy books in independent bookstores or you're a traitor uh, and all that shit. Um, and um, even even people on the left, uh, like like uh, like socialists, who are usually pretty um, globalists, uh, yeah, uh, I, I had have been try have been starting to push uh, about ten years ago uh, stuff about um, you know uh, they they call that economic patriotism where you should uh, favor uh, French brands uh, uh, against you know American and also Chinese. Sure. Stuff. Oh yeah, so, yeah. Uh, the Chinese, I guess, they're really they're really starting to have a large global footprint. Yeah. Too. So uh, um, I I don't really agree. The only thing that I that I don't um, the only American imperialism thing that I don't I am not a fan of is stuff like Facebook and and Google um, because of um, because of how they uh, enforce censorship. Uh, on on their platforms yeah. and uh, it's um, it's it's a kind of you know um, it, it's a kind of a, a war on 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 freedom of speech and, um, and it's this thing that uh, here we are a, a really libertarian where when it comes to um, expressing yourself and, and and humor and and stuff and uh, and art and so um, the censorship like. When we see an American TV show and and uh, the some words are beeped because the the person says fuck or whatever, it seems mm -hmm. absolutely crazy to us. Like like what? Yeah. It's it's like your people are stuck in second grade. You know when you shouldn't say bad words. It's mind blowing that you uh, put up with this. We don't understand, and it it's, uh, it frightens us. Yeah. That you, yeah, you, it's it's a really regressive thing uh, that that for some reason we still enforce, um, and it's it's getting worse, unfortunately. Yeah, um, and and, and, it's, and it it really frightens us that you're trying with uh, Facebook and Google uh, and, and their uh, their overwhelming uh, domination of the communication online uh, market. Uh, yeah, that uh, America is is making the world become like that, and they policing uh, speech all around the world because, well, they own Facebook, they they own Google, so uh, and and Apple also, and uh, that's that that's the big problem right now. In regards to Facebook and Google and Apple, for example, you know, um, there, I think that there's two big reasons why they do that, which. I don't know a single person that likes it. I think that most people that I talk to in person, you know, that know about this, they they fucking hate it. But at the same time, it's like a it's like a weird dependency thing that we haven't been able to, you know, the, it would stop if people banded together and and they went on strike from Facebook or they went on strike from using Google. But it's become such a thing of convenience. It's become such a thing of 
you know, uh, this, that, and the other that, um, that, you know, that, that were mm. dependent on it. And, and uh, that's a bit of a problem because they can steamroll over us with whatever kind of crazy shit they want to. So in order, you know, like for bleeping out cuss words in TV shows, or, um, that is enforced by the FCC. And um, so the FCC, you know, they've had some really regressive ideas about what should be censored. And it, it yeah, I've heard I've heard a lot of crazy shit about the FCC, and it, it's absolutely baffling because you know it's supposed to be freedom of speech, but my mom, growing up, you know, she she would always say um, she had a theory about why there were so many uh, sexual predators in the U.S. She said it's uh, she used to say it's because sex is a bad thing here. Um, sex, sex is, you know, I mean, we, we were mm. a country found, founded by Puritans, you know, and, yeah. and uh, an, an immensely Christian nation, far more Christian than any country in Europe, as far as I know. Um, and, you know, that's had an effect on our laws and that's had an effect on our society. And, you know, we've been pretty regressive in regards to you know, changing it and things like that. Uh, and <clears throat> so she said, you know, in the movies, what, what they'll show you, they'll show you someone getting their head blown off with a shotgun and that's rated PG 13, but then, you know, show mm -hmm. someone's tits and it's rated R. Yeah. And that's she, crazy. she said, that's because sex is a, is a negative thing. And she believed it shouldn't be. And one thing she said is she's like, in countries like France or in the Netherlands, you know, seeing a tit in a movie isn't a bad thing. And, mm. you know, I was I was kind of um, I was really intrigued with that idea that, you know, I wonder what it would look like if we weren't so fucking uh, regressive about how we dealt with things like that, like sex or, you know, because. If sex is something you have to hide, if sex is something you have to be ashamed about, you're going to develop backwards ideas about, at least in theory, you're going to... Yeah, absolutely. That's why kids who don't have sexual education uh, in, in school uh, make so, so many mistakes and, and uh, so, many, so much bad things happen to them. And it's still amazing... That so many kids, you know, my mom, my mom, I was lucky to have a pretty uh, open mm -hmm. family, you know, growing up where, where we talked about these sort of things. And, and yeah, you know, it's a little embarrassing and so on. But at least at least, you know, if I had a question or I had a concern, um, I could ask about it and we would talk about it. Yeah. Um, whereas I still talk to so many people that, you know, um, they'll say oh no i was you know i never talked to my parents about sex i never talked to my parents about sex because it would you know um either they the par either the parents are religious or the parents they say oh they aren't that type of people which is bullshit you know if they've got kids they know about sex they've had sex before if they had kids so for fuck's mm -hmm. sake you know talk to your children about sex make tell them it's not a bad thing yeah it's something that we naturally do and that we shouldn't be ashamed of doing yeah. and um you know just so long as we're careful about it everything is fine and you know speaking of changing the stigma about video games i think that as time goes on um the stigma about nudity in films and about censorship I hope, I'm not confident, but I hope that that will change in the future. We are becoming less religious. Mm. Um, you know, more and more people are identifying as, as atheist or agnostic or non-religious every day. Um, and so that's going to play a big factor, I think, in, in, in personal freedoms. Um, you know, that doesn't mean straying away from traditions either. You know, a lot of people are afraid to, you know leave church or leave, you know, their religion because of tradition. And, you know, the, the thing is, is that, you know, you, you might have something that you like or something that your family's done for three, four hundred years. That's fine. You know, keep, keep that up. Keep doing Thanksgiving. Keep doing Christmas. Keep doing this, that, and the other. 
but you don't need to be a Bible thumper, mm. you know, to feel like you have a set of morals or to feel like, you know, you're accepted or like you're a good person. Um, anyway, that that's just my opinion about that, because I was a part of the church for a few years. Uh-huh. And um, I noticed that one, it massively affected my opinions on the world. Um, and then as after I got out of it, I sort of realized, you know, that things aren't the way that I was looking at them. Um, and so I know that this is kind of, it's kind of a long tangent, but, you know, I think that one thing I wanted to mention is that um, we have a TV channel here in the U.S. called TCM, Turner Classic Movies, right? And so you can watch movies from the 40s and 50s and so on. And I notice a lot, a a decent chunk of movies that they play from the forties and Mm thirties are French films, um, which used to be massively popular in the U S. Um, and you know, it's kind of, I think about that and I think about, you know, the fact that it would be a good thing in my opinion, I think it would be a good thing if we allowed some other countries, you know, different cultures to influence us. Um, you know, we're probably the largest monolingual country in the world, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, well, and I, yeah, I, don't, I, I don't, don't know. I don't know if the, the Chinese speak a lot of foreign languages. But, um, well, I know that they've got a lot of different dialects, whereas the English that we speak here is, is pretty universal. We might have different accents, yeah, but as far yeah. as dialects go, there are very few. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, case in point, this conversation. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's good to have what, what's called a, a lingua franca, uh, when uh, people can understand themselves all around the globe. Uh, and it's nice that it's English, which is... Uh, uh, um, I've I've learned a few languages uh, in my life, and it was by far the easiest to uh, to master. It's not it's um, it's really uh, it's fluid, and and you can you know you can verb nouns that that is so great that is that that, yeah. has, that was such a, a freedom uh, when when you when you when you speak and um, well. I think that it's already happening uh, with the internet and stuff. I mean, uh, uh, the America being, you know, influenced by other cultures. I see a lot of Americans, you know, who are fans of British shows, for example, like Doctor Who or Sherlock. I see a lot of Amer- yeah. American people who are fans of anime and and, and yeah. Japanese stuff. I see so many of them, and, and also Japanese video games like Nintendo and stuff like that. I see a lot a lot of people who are, who are fans of, you know, Zelda, Dark Souls. Typically Japanese um, products and um, what else? Um, yeah, in music also uh, there there there's a lot of uh, European bands uh, that are really popular in the U.S. and I think that it's with the internet and stuff it's gonna accelerate. I mean, uh, PewDiePie is European. He's from Sweden and he's hugely popular in the U.S. Yeah, yeah, he is. Uh, he's a Sweden that lives in in Brighton. So you know, I mean, but but. Kind of talks like an American almost. Yeah, but I, you but know? I, I see a lot of, uh, or or uh, this uh, this memer called uh, Grande, who is from uh, yep. the island of Malta. Uh, yeah, he's Maltese. Yeah, and uh, that or oh, Pyrocynical, or uh, at, yep, I mean, he's 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 uh, he's, he's British or uh, Jacksep- Jacksepticeye. I mean, the the example are are are, are many, and um, yeah. I have a large uh, American audience, despite be, be, being not American at all, and um, sure that that's always interesting. Uh, and I think I think that yeah yeah you're absolutely right. Um, and you know I think that this kind of tie maybe hopefully ties back into the point where like you know um, as time goes on you know it'll become more of a mainstream influence. Um, Also, the other thing, like, it's so much easier to talk to, like, I'm, I'm on the West Coast of the US right now, and Mm -hmm. you are in Paris, you know, that's, Mm -hmm. 
and and we're having a phone conversation with one you know or yeah. i mean you know essentially yeah, yeah. um you know uh, that that's absolutely incredible i've got friends in scotland i've got friends in england i've got friends in germany russia uh i've got friends in italy spain um i've got several friends in canada i've got a couple friends in mexico you know just all of that thanks to the internet yeah and I get to ask, man, and because I'm, I'm, I'm a little, I don't know if I call myself obnoxious about it, but I, I really am very intrigued by other people's languages and cultures. And so I get to ask them lots of questions. Mm. And therefore, if anybody, you know, I, I mean, I almost feel like maybe it's because I was a little bit starved of that growing up, you know, where it was mm. just where it was just uh, Americanism all the time, you know, and whatever subcultures we had in the U.S. and so on. Um, you know, it always surprised me to learn growing up that some of these bands that I listened to were, were British. Or, um, for example, do you remember Bullet From My Valentine? They were a, yeah. a metal band. You know, it surprised the hell out of me when I found out they're Welsh. I was like, what the fuck? You know, are you serious? I thought that they were American. And... Um, you know, the internet helped open a wider scope for me, anyway, to understand that the that the world is a really wide and big place with a lot of different people. But the internet helps me connect with those people, um, and it helps. It it really helps me to have a better idea of what the world actually is, um, and and so you know, I I I don't know. Yeah, you. I think you're right. Um, you know, I think that especially the youth are are being influenced by other cultures. And who knows what that will lead to in the future? You know, who knows if, if that will lead to a, a more, you know, polyglot United States, you know, uh, people speaking more than one language or um, uh, hopefully people. Yeah. I heard it was really good for the brain and the neuronal elasticity. Right. It, you know, because people who speak several languages are less susceptible to have Alzheimer's, for example. And, and, and yeah, that's a, that's a good thing. Like, for example, you know, uh, I have studied, I wanted to be a linguistic anthropologist when I was younger mm -hmm. um, because the, how languages change and their vernacular is interesting. Um, but I would study into a language, but would never become influ or would become fluent in it. And so I started studying Spanish a couple months ago. Um, just and, and I started listening to Spanish music, and I started watching Spanish YouTubers. Um, just because one, I you know, Spanish would probably be the most useful second language in the u.s you know because there are so many spanish speakers um, yeah and also if you want to visit south america you you yeah. speak the language yeah. of uh, you know 20 countries well yeah th that and all of central america is spanish speaking and yep. spain yeah you know so i could go to all those countries i could talk to you know um it doesn't really matter where in the u.s you go you'll find someone of hispanic descent um, and the majority of those people are English speaking, but they're also Spanish speaking. And a lot of them speak better Spanish than they do English. And so I think that it would be useful. Um, just like I know some sign language. And so if I run into a deaf person, I can yeah. have a, I can have a rudimentary conversation with them. That's cool. Um, yeah, just the other day I was in Hawaii and I saw this guy wearing these crazy shoes. And so I walked up to him and I said, oh, look at your shoes are awesome. And he was and he pointed at his ear and didn't uh -huh. say anything. And so I gave the sign for him that said deaf. Um, and uh -huh. and he said, yeah. And so anyway, we had a little conversation. It's always been a useful tool. Um, and so speaking uh, a second language, I think, fluently. Um, would be an absolute asset and so now that i'm older and i can concentrate better hmm. um i think that you know uh, i'll be successful in this because i have the influence and i have all of the spanish music and i have all of the spanish youtubers and yeah. and it's just like how a lot of people learn english from what i understand you know Absolutely. people watching 
people watching American or, or British shows mm. or being on English speaking websites. That's and, how and I this, learned. Yeah. And, and, I mean, I learned yeah. at school also, but, uh, you know, the majority of what I learned was being on English speaking websites and playing uh when, when i was a kid uh, video games were not translated so you had to speak at least a little english to understand what you were doing and um it, did that ever piss you off like that that when you were younger the... no 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 i i um uh, i mean i was too young to be pissed off about things like that you know i started gaming uh i i, I don't know in 1994 i think uh, i was re I, I was uh really young i was in um uh, you know, uh, second grade, something like that. And uh, so sure. uh, it just was a th normal thing, you know. Video games, most of them were all in English, so you had to learn a little English or have a dictionary on hand to be able to play. And that that was just it. That was how it was, you know. Everyone was playing Sonic and Streets of Rage and, uh, you know, Super Mario World and all these video games were in English. There was no translation, so you had to you had to find out what it meant um, because there was no, no other choice. Are I there? Mean, I mean, there there are translations now, though, for yeah, video yeah, games, yeah. Um, which is which is cool. But you know, I, um, my year twelve uh, teacher he called English the business language. Um, you know what's another thing that's funny is that if you're a, a pilot, if you fly commercial planes, mm -hmm. you have to either be able to speak English or French. Those are the two languages. Um, yeah, I heard that. You, yeah, if, if, if you're Chinese and you're flying into Germany, you have to be able to speak English, mm. you know, which is weird. Um but uh, I'm somebody told me that, um, so I don't exactly know the details of why that's the case. But you know, I I think it has something to do with post World War II decisions about commercial flight. No idea. Um, that would be interesting but, to look into. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, what time is it there now? I'm I'm not sure what. Oh, it's it's three thirty in the morning here. Yeah, you know. it's uh, oh, it's noon for me. I gotta meet a friend. Uh, we want to see a museum together. Uh, oh, right on. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that's more than three hours of talking. It's uh, it's it's usually uh, what we do. Right on. Well, then, yeah, I I had a really good time. Yeah, um, me too. Covered a lot of topics, and, and I think that's a pretty cool thing, a, a good, genuine conversation. Yeah, that's always, that's always great. Well, anyway, hey, hey, thanks a bunch for having me. I, I appreciate the invite. Um, no problem. And, and um, enjoy the museum. I am going to go to bed. Yeah, have a nice uh, <laughs> night. And uh, to everyone who's listening, that was episode 8 of Mohe Talk, the worst podcast on the internet. If you really like what I do, don't forget to subscribe, or if you're listening to on SoundCloud, you know, I don't really know how it works, but uh, if you really like uh, what I do, please consider a subscription to my Patreon, and uh, that would be really cool to help me continue uh, doing what I do in the best possible conditions. Uh, thanks for listening, and see ya really soon. Peace!